TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. With me now, we have two guests who are going to be debating whether Jesus is the angel of the Lord. First, we have Anthony Rogers, who is a Trinitarian and will be representing the affirmative position. How you doing, Anthony? Hey, you're muted, man. What the heck is wrong with you? Amateur hour, man. <laughs> I, I have to make you feel at home. <laughs> Anthony always has to do something at the beginning to ruin the entire the entire thing. All right. <laughs> How you doing, Anthony? I'm doing good. Hey, why don't uh, why don't you go ahead and and tell people a little bit about yourself in case they're in case they're uh, they're new to Anthony Rogers. Okay, sure. I was born and raised in Southern California. I mentioned that because Solomon here is from Placentia, California, and I'm familiar with it. Uh, used to romp around those areas uh, back in my youth, but uh, I am currently a pastor in Southern uh, or South Carolina. I specifically go and minister to prisoners in uh, throughout the state as the regional director for a prison ministry here. I also have been engaged in evangelism and apologetics for decades. I have been a longtime author for Answering Islam, among other things. I also uh, contribute to this channel with David Wood, and that's about it. I have a wife and uh, four kids as well. And uh, some people are pointing out that with your black shirt and the strip of white showing there, you look like a priest. So, Well, I am not a priest. <laughs> All right, so we have Anthony Rogers and we have Solomon Ja Rodriguez. Solomon, how are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Why don't you go? So, ahead? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure most viewers are not familiar with you because you haven't been on here before. But uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and share a few words about yourself? Well, um, I actually from La Puente, California, so I know it sounds like La Placentia, oh. but not too far, not too far. Uh, so you know, I'm a. I've been a Christian. Uh, a lot of my life, and um, obviously I believe I'm not a Trinitarian, I once was. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, and I have a couple blogs, uh, and I like to write about, you know, Scripture and my understanding of uh, passages and doctrines. Uh, I've read up on the early Church Fathers. Um, you know, currently, I, like I said, I live here in La Puente, California, with my family, and um, I have a ministry called Kingdom of the Son of God. Uh, doctrinally, um, I'm Anabaptist, so I, I I'm a big fan of the early Anabaptists in the you know 1500s. So that's kind of where I stand doctrinally. The words of Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, um, and uh, kind of that's kind of where I I stand. So I'm a, I call myself a Seventh Day Anabaptist. Keep the Sabbath, and and that type of thing. I believe in the law of God. So. And uh, the, one of my favorite uh, studies in the scriptures is the Davidic covenant and Jesus being the seed of David, which is what uh, you'll see I, I talk about somewhat here. All right. And uh, so Anthony was wrong about your location. Um, makes me wonder what else Anthony is wrong about. <laughs> he was close, though. <laughs> I, I knew it was La Fuente, but because they're close, I got them mixed up. Uh, now, now ju just uh, because... Most people aren't going to be, um, you know, at, at, at the level of theology of, you know, like an Anthony Rogers or, or something like that. But I, I want everyone to to be clear on this. And uh, if you guys could comment this, this topic is Jesus. Is Jesus the angel of the Lord wouldn't be primary, wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be a Trinitarian versus Unitarian issue completely because there would be trinitarians who say who don't believe that jesus is the angel of the lord so is, is, is that right there are some i would say that's primarily limited to the modern period the vast majority of christians throughout the ages have held to the idea that the angel of the lord is god but uh certainly what's critical is belief in the deity of christ that christ is a divine person together with the father and the son in terms of orthodoxy that's mm -hmm. that's critical so there are Trinitarians who would not recognize the angel of the Lord as one of the persons of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Um, so the point here would be, ladies and gentlemen, don't just side with Anthony if you're a Trinitarian, right? So don't just don't just pick the side 
of whoever represents you and say, I'm going to agree with his answer to this topic. So the, the point here was everyone should be listening to the arguments and then making a better, better informed decision on your position on this issue. All right. The format is going to be 20 minute opening statements. We'll start with Anthony. Um, I'll get the, the rest of us off the screen while uh, each presenter is speaking. Uh, following the opening statements, we'll have 15 minute rebuttals. Then after that, we'll have 10 minutes of cross-examination uh, each. So 10 minutes of Anthony cross-examining Solomon and then 10 minutes of Solomon cross-examining Anthony. This will be followed by eight-minute rebuttals and five-minute conclusions. So with all of that said, is, uh, is everyone ready to get started? Yep. All right, Solomon, I would ask you to mute your microphone right uh, right now. Uh, Anthony, you'll have 20 minutes. I will, um, if you have some timer, that's fine, but I will also uh, be giving you hand signals if you can see your Skype. Um, at about one minute, I'll bring myself back up on the screen. And so uh, time signals, I'll probably give a five, uh, a three, a two, a one. And then, uh, you know, this is time's up and I'm not super strict on time. So if someone goes over, you know, a few seconds to finish up their, their sentence or their thought or something like that, that's fine. If, if, you know, if it's more than four or five seconds and I'll just award the same extension to the, uh, the other participant. All right. Is everyone ready? Ready. All right. I'm going to get, I'm going to get Anthony up on the screen by himself and Anthony, you have 20 minutes whenever you're ready to start. All right, I want to begin by giving all praise and thanks to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, thanking him for loving me and saving me, and uh, sending uh, the Father for sending his Son into the world, and the Son, in turn, sending the Spirit into my heart, whereby I cry out, Abba, Father. Since I am a Trinitarian, my affirmative answer to this question uh, does not entail that Jesus is a creature. For according to the Bible, the angel of the Lord is emphatically not a created being. Contrary to popular ignorance, the word for angel in both Hebrew and Greek is not an ontological term indicating a specific kind of being, but a functional term used for human beings, celestial spirits, and even for God, anyone who's functioning in a revelatory capacity. The word literally just means messenger. And so the connotation of the word or the identity and nature of anyone called a messenger can only be determined from the relevant context where the word is used. When it comes to the specific contexts that talk about the angel of the Lord, not angels in general, they uniformly, abundantly, and unambiguously identify him as a divine person. For example, in Genesis 48, Jacob prayed to the angel of the Lord who had previously appeared to him at Bethel and even wrestled with him at Peniel. And in that prayer, Jacob referred to the angel as his shepherd and redeemer and the God, Ha Elohim, before whom his fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. Okay, this fact is reaffirmed later by the prophet Hosea when he said in chapter 12 of his prophecy, Yes, he, meaning Jacob, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even Jehovah, the God of hosts, Jehovah is his memorial name. To clinch the matter, in Genesis 31, 11, and 13, we're told that the angel of the Lord himself said to Jacob, Anochi ha el Bethel, meaning I am the God of Bethel. So according to patriarchs like Jacob, prophets like Hosea, and the angel of the Lord himself, he is not a created angel, but a fully divine person functioning in a revelatory capacity. He is, if you will, the messenger par excellence, a divine person who is therefore uniquely and perfectly able to reveal God to men uh, through his person, words, and actions. Conceptually, this is the same idea that's stated in the prologue of John's Gospel, where he identifies Jesus as the Word, a revelatory term, and goes on to say, No man has seen God at any time, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. He has exegeted him. Well, in order to demonstrate that Jesus is the angel of the Lord, I want to begin by addressing four things that we would expect to find and must find to be the case if Jesus is the angel of the Lord. First, since the angel is identified as deity, as I just showed, 
if Jesus is the angel of the Lord, we would expect to find and must find the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, identified as deity. And this is exactly what we find in both Testaments. With respect to the coming Messiah, every word for deity is used for him in the Hebrew Bible. He's called El, the word for God, in Isaiah 9:6. In fact, El Gibor, the mighty God. He's called Elohim, God, by the Father in Psalm 45. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. In Malachi 3, 1, he's referred to as Ha-Adon, the word for Lord, where the word Lord is even preceded by the definite article, a construction used exclusively for deity. In Psalm 110, 5, David referred to the Messiah as Adonai, the Lord, which is likewise an exclusive title for deity. And he's even called by God's covenant name, Jehovah. For example, in Genesis, uh, Jeremiah 23, 6, the coming branch of David is called Yahweh Sidkenu, Jehovah, our righteousness. All of these passages and many others I could mention are messianic, and most of them are explicitly applied to Jesus in the New Testament in places like Mark 1, Matthew 11, Hebrews 1. And two prophetic testimonies of this sort, Jesus and the apostles add innumerable testimonies of their own. Several times in all four gospels in places like Mark 650, Matthew 14, 27, John 620, Jesus uses the I am formula of the Lord found in Old Testament passages like Deuteronomy 32, 39. In addition, according to Jesus and the Shema quoting Jewish apostles of the New Testament, Jesus is clearly the Lord of the Old Testament, the one Lord, Kyrios Heis, of the Shema. For example, Jesus himself referred to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath in Mark 2, something that can only be said about Israel's one Lord. Paul called him the Lord of glory in 1 Corinthians 2.8. Jude called him our only sovereign and Lord in Jude 1.4. Moreover, in passages like Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 8, Jesus is called Kyrios Heis, the one Lord, a phrase that comes right out of the Shema and wouldn't have been missed by any first century Jew. Finally, the vast majority of Old Testament citations in the New Testament that contain the word Jehovah are applied to Jesus in the New Testament. So just like the angel of the Lord, Jesus is identified as Lord and God. Second, since the angel of the Lord existed during the Old Covenant period, if Jesus is the angel of the Lord, then we would expect to find and must find that Jesus existed prior to the virgin birth. Once again, this is taught in both Testaments. In Isaiah 9, for example, the coming Messiah is referred to as Aviad. Syntactically, Ad, meaning everlasting, is preceded by and joined to the word Av, meaning father or possessor, which is an idiomatic way of saying in Hebrew that he is the possessor of that quality, the, the quality of Ad, everlastingness. So he possesses that as an attribute. In Micah 5, we're told that the Messiah, who would go forth from Bethlehem, is the very one whose goings forth are from of old, from the days of eternity. The prophet uses here both the singular and the plural. He will go forth from Bethlehem, and his goings forth, multiple goings forth, are from of old. This is also the testimony of the New Testament. Jesus repeatedly spoke of coming down from heaven times without number, and of going back to where he shared eternal glory with the Father. Uh, too many passages to count, John 17, 5, one among them. In Colossians 1.17, Paul said of Jesus, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He even uses the present tense. He is right now before all things. In Hebrews 1.2, it's written uh, that uh, uh, the Son, everything was created in, in, uh, through the Son, and the word there uh, for the worlds is eons, meaning he created the ages, and he also is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. So if the ages were created through the Son, and he is the one who upholds them, then the Son existed before the ages from the days of eternity, like Micah 5, 2 says. Later in the same chapter of Hebrews, the Father is quoted as saying about the Son, you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning. He goes on to say all the, all the created things through the, uh, the Son uh, will experience change and will perish, but, quote, about the Son, you are the same and your years will never come to an end. This is why the author of Hebrews ends the book saying that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
So like the angel of the Lord, the son existed prior to the virgin birth. Third, since the Old Testament enumerates three and only three divine persons, namely the Father, the angel of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit, and distinguishes the angel from the Father and the Spirit, then if Jesus is the angel of the Lord, we would expect to find and must find the Messiah, Jesus, as a divine person distinguished from the Father and the Holy Spirit. And this is exactly what we find in both Testaments. In the Old Testament, for example, Isaiah 63, Isaiah cried out to the Father to do for Israel in the future what he did for them in the past when he redeemed Israel and delivered her from her afflictions by sending forth the angel of his presence to save them and by sending forth the Holy Spirit to dwell within Moses. This prayer of Isaiah for the Father, the angel of the Lord and the Holy Spirit to accomplish a yet greater salvation for the people of God was anticipated by Isaiah elsewhere in his book when he put these words in the mouth of the coming Messiah in Isaiah 61.1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me to bring good news to the afflicted. Hearken back to Isaiah 63, the angel saved them in their affliction. Uh, and all of this, by the way, was fulfilled when, as Paul says in Galatians 4, the fullness of the time came and God sent forth his son. The, the word is ex apostele, and it's very strong in the Greek. He sent out his son who was made of a woman, made under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So both testaments distinguish the Son from the Father and the Spirit, even as the Old Testament distinguishes the angel of the Lord from the Father and the Spirit, and it attributes to Jesus the same saving action performed by the angel of the Lord, redemption. Fourth, since the angel of the Lord is that divine person who regularly appeared to the patriarchs and prophets in the Old Testament, if Jesus is the angel of the Lord, now become incarnate, then we would expect all appearances of the angel of the Lord to cease during Christ's earthly sojourn. And after his resurrection, we would expect to find Jesus to be the subject of divine theophanies. And this is exactly what we find. Uh, while the New Testament mentions appearances of angels during Christ's earthly ministry to Zechariah, to Mary, to the shepherds, and to Joseph in a dream, it never mentions a single appearance of the angel of the Lord. After the resurrection, moreover, all theophanic appearances are appearances of Jesus and Jesus alone, such as Christ's appearance to Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, or Christ's appearance to John on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1. Now, all of this is exactly what we would expect to find if Jesus is the angel of the Lord. And these four streams, they all flow into each other and flow directly to Jesus. If we were to ask Moses and the prophets, who is that person who is identified as God, who is active during uh, the Old Covenant period, who is distinguished from the Father and the Holy Spirit, who came down from heaven, often appearing in the form of a man, who accomplished the redemption, the salvation of God's people, they would all say the angel of the Lord. If we ask the exact same question of the apostles, they would all say to a man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this ever-growing and flowing sea of evidence is driven on yet further by explicit testimonies of the Spirit. According to Exodus 3, it was the angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses in the burning bush, saying that he had seen, note the word, the affliction of his people in Egypt, and that their afflictions were his afflictions, and he was calling Moses to identify with him and his people over against Egypt. Corresponding to this, in Hebrews 11.25, we're told that Moses, quote, chose to endure affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, which is just to say that Moses chose to be identified with Christ and his people. Later in the book of Exodus, we're told that it was the angel of the Lord who went before and behind Israel, Exodus 14, 19, leading them through the, uh, uh, out of Egypt through the sea and who later destroyed those who didn't believe in the, in the wilderness by sending fiery serpents among them. 
hearkening back to this, Jude 1, 5 says, I desire to remind you that Jesus, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. In the same vein, in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul said, I do not want you to be uh, unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Later in the same chapter, Paul said, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. So the author of Hebrews, Jude, the Lord's half-brother, and the Apostle Paul all identified Jesus as the one who appeared to Moses, the one who led Israel out of Egypt, the one who was the source of their spiritual sustenance, and the one who later destroyed unbelieving Israelites. All the things that are said about the angel of the Lord. The events of the Exodus, what people don't seem to realize, were a divinely ordained and providentially orchestrated set of events that served as a kind of dress rehearsal. Uh, the events of the Exodus laid out the program and even introduced us to the central character by whom the grand drama of the true and eternal future redemption was going to be enacted. Uh, what the angel of the Lord was doing in the Old Testament, coming down from heaven, appearing in the form of a man, revealing God to men, accomplishing redemption for the people of God at the Exodus, all of it was a prelude, an anticipation, a foretaste of what he was going to do in a greater and more definitive way in the future when he became flesh and accomplished not merely a temporal but an eternal redemption. Hebrews 9.12, the true exodus for God's people. Luke 9.31, the literal Greek. Indeed, this is why when the prophets spoke of that future redemption, they often did so by borrowing words, phrases, and themes from the original Exodus. They hearkened back to the time when the angel of the Lord, the angel who established the covenant with Israel, Judges 2, 1, was sent before their face to prepare their way and bring them into the wilderness, Exodus 23. For example, we see Isaiah doing this in Isaiah 40, verse 3, where he's talking about a future new Exodus, the true redemption. This is what he says. The voice of one calling in the wilderness, Midbar, the same term, hearkening back to the Exodus, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord, Jehovah, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Likewise, hearkening back to the Exodus and also picking up on some of the same language you just heard from Isaiah 40, verse 3, Malachi 3, 1 says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he'll clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you seek. Literally, the Melach Habarit, the angel of the covenant. He is the one who's coming to accomplish this new redemption. Both of these prophecies about the new Exodus, where a voice and a messenger are sent to prepare the way for Jehovah, according to Isaiah, the angel of the covenant, according to Malachi, both of these prophecies are applied to Jesus in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 1, where he writes, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in uh, the prophets, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. No more definitive proof should be needed by anyone who fears God and submits to his word to see that Jesus is explicitly identified as the angel of the Lord. In light of this, it's little wonder that ancient Jews, Jews in earlier times, recognized the prototypical nature of the Exodus for future redemption, which would be accomplished by the angel of the Lord. For example, in the early Jewish Midrash called Exodus Rabbah, it says uh, it will be similar, this is a quote, it will be similar in the future when he will reveal himself and redemption will come for Israel as it is written, behold, I send my messenger and he'll clear the way before your face. It even quotes this angel text about what's going to happen in the future, a messianic text. Furthermore, when Isaiah 9, 6 says of the Messiah, this is the name by which he will be called, wonderful counselor, etc., the pre-Christian Jewish translation paraphrased it this way. This is the name by which he will be called, the angel of great counsel, 
These pre-Christian Jews recognize that because Messiah's name is wonderful, then he must be that divine person known as the angel of the Lord, the very one who said to Manoah in Judges 13, my name is wonderful. Now, not only ancient Jews, but Christians from the beginning have recognized this great truth. The identification of Christ as the angel, understood as a fully divine person, is both the ancient and ubiquitous confession of the early church regarding the identity of Jesus. It was taught by Theophilus, who was the bishop in Antioch, uh, the major center of early Christian and apostolic activity. It was taught by Justin Martyr in Ephesus of Asia, the home and final resting place of John and Mary. Uh, the same Justin also taught in the famous catechetical school of Rome. Uh, it was taught uh, by Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyons in Gaul, who was the disciple of Polycarp, the disciple of John. It was also taught in Alexandria in Egypt by men such as Clement and in Carthage, North Africa by Tertullian. So all of this was taught in the earliest days by men who knew the apostles or their disciples from Jerusalem to Syria, to Asia, to Rome, all the way up into Gaul in Europe and down to Carthage and, and Alexandria in Africa. This is why scholars such as Gunther Junker in his doctoral dissertation on the angel of the Lord could say the title angel in reference to Jesus uh, reveals an extremely early and widely accepted Christology. As well, Dr. Adolphine Backer said that this title for Jesus belongs to the earliest stratum of Christian belief. So this was the faith of the early church before the heresy of the Ebionites, the Modalists, the Arians, before every Unitarian departure from the faith that was once for all entrusted unto the saints. And it's still the faith of the church today. And I'll conclude with that. Wow, wow, wow. One of these rare instances where Anthony finished on time. Had five seconds left instead of going 30 seconds over. All right. Thank you for your opening statement, Anthony. Let me get Solomon up on the screen. Let's see. All right. Uh, you ready, Solomon? Uh, Anthony, if you could, if you could mute your mic, and Solomon, your mic is back on, correct? Yes. You're sounding a little quieter there. Uh, go ahead and talk. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You good? Yeah. Uh, all right, so I'll just get you up on the screen by yourself here. You will have 20 minutes. Uh, again, if you can if you can see me at all, I'll give you a five, three, two, okay. one, and then uh, uh, with about a minute left, I'll put myself back up on the screen, and then. Um, all right, so you can start anytime you're ready. All right, so is Jesus the angel of the Lord? That's the topic, obviously. It's not whether or not the Trinity is true. I am a, a Unitarian. Um, so is Jesus the angel of the Lord? This has to meet uh, the criteria of two or three witnesses, as Paul says. And also, remember, God doesn't reveal anything except first he reveal it to his servants, the prophets. So we got to go through uh, the prophets, the testimony of the apostles. Do we have witnesses and that thus saith the Lord that say that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Now, why is this important? This is important because even Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, he says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might bear well with him. And then John in 2 John 9 through 11 also warns to not receive anybody that doesn't come with the doctrine of Christ. Now, I'm not casting aspersions. We all have, there's been a, a, you know, a tumbleweed of confusion in Christianity. So we're all trying to learn. But it doesn't lessen the importance of having the right Jesus. And I'm sure Anthony would agree. So um, this is an important topic. Why? Because the prophets, when you go through history, see from Genesis to Revelation, we have a story. And the story is about our Messiah, Jesus. And it starts in Genesis 3.15 that the descendant of Eve is going to trample the serpent, the head of the serpent. So that's pretty general because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, right? But then as the story goes throughout uh, the Old Testament, it narrows the scope of who the Messiah would be and where we would, he would come from in terms of his nature. Uh, J uh, Abraham is promised that his seed would be as numerable as the stars in the sky and the sand on the sea seashore innumerable. As a matter of fact, Genesis chapter 2 is a beautiful picture of the gospel. And we know that Paul says in Galatians 3 verse 16 that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Okay, 
So then we go on a little further to Genesis 49, 10. And so now we know that it's not only going to be a descendant of Eve, obviously the Messiah, which anybody can qualify for that, but now it's narrowed down to Abraham's seed. So in Genesis, we narrow down even further to the tribe of Judah out of Israel. Okay, that's where the scepter of righteousness and the scepter of the kingdom is going to be between the feet of Judah. Okay, but it even narrows even further in 2 Samuel 7, chapter, uh, yes, chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. Now the promise is given to King David that of David's offspring, of his seed, of his bowels, one will come up and establish the Davidic dynasty forever. The eschatological David of which we see, uh, you know, Solomon was a type uh, you know, some of the righteous kings of Israel gave us a glimpse of the future uh, spotless uh, Lamb of God who was of the seed of David. So there's a story uh, being weaved that starts obviously in Genesis uh, before the foundation of the world, as we learn in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, of this Messiah who would be slain for the sins of the world. So we got to find prophets. Did any prophet prophesy of the future Messiah to be of the angel? Of the angel of the Lord, or uh, or is it what exactly what the prophets say, which is what I'm going to show you through the scriptures, that the prophets continually and over and over again show that the promised messianic king would be from the line of David. So as we go through the prophets, we have to know that um, God's going to re reveal everything to his prophets. So as much as I respect the church fathers, uh, they cannot add to scripture. They cannot come up with a new doctrine. It has to be found in the prophets. In fact, um, Jesus himself never identified himself as the angel of the Lord. That's important to remember. And he had the perfect opportunity to, in Mark chapter 12, verses 24 through 27, I'll read that. And Jesus answering said unto them, do you not therefore err because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? He says, for when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Right there would have been the perfect opportunity to identify himself as the one that was there speaking to Abraham. Now, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, we know in Acts 3.13, Peter identifies that God is the father of Jesus. Jesus could have identified himself as the angel of the Lord, speaking to Moses in the bush. In fact, Stephen, we have another opportunity in Acts chapter 7 for Stephen to identify and connect Jesus with the angel of the Lord, because in Acts chapter 7, Stephen gives his dissertation of the history of Israel and their rebellion towards God. In Acts 7 verses 38, 30 through 38, Stephen says, when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Okay? And it just continues on. So for, from verses 30 to 38, he talks about the angel of the Lord. He mentions the angel of the Lord. But when we fast forward to the end of his dissertation, Acts 7, 52 to 56, now he mentions Jesus. But Stephen does not connect Jesus with the angel of the Lord. He talks about them as their two ships passing in the wind. Verses 52 to 56, Stephen says, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. So the prophets showed before the coming of the just one, Jesus. What did the prophets say about Jesus and his nature, who he would be, where he would be from? Did they ever say he would be the angel of the Lord? No. Let's go back to, let's go back to the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> so let's go to the prophets because we have to have the prophets show this and two or three witnesses. If we get two or three prophets to show this, then Anthony is right. Then Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Now, going back to Isaiah 9, 6, which Anthony quoted, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Okay, so he's called Wonderful Counselor. Well, if you go to Zechariah 6, 9 through 15, and it talks about the future branch of David using Joshua as a type, the son of Jehozadak, it says the council of peace will be between them both. What does that mean? That the council of peace is between the office of king and priest that the Messiah would have. It, so when he's called here a wonderful counselor, he's not being identified as the angel of the Lord. It's just talking about he's going to be our high priestly counselor and, and a great one and a mighty one because he's righteous. Okay, 
But in verse 7, it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. So when we read Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it's important to know that Isaiah is not going against what the other prophets are stating. He's just saying that this Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, is going to come from the line of David, just like all the prophets talk about. And uh, in Zechariah 9, 12 through 13, again, talking about what I mentioned about the council of peace will be between them both. And that council is written in reference to the high priestly ministry and kingship of Jesus. Zechariah says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh Jehovah of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and shall build the temple of Jehovah, even he shall build the temple of Jehovah, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace will be between, be between them both. So when he's called Wonderful Counselor in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, it's in reference to his priesthood. We go to Isaiah also in Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, and there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, and the branch out of his root shall bear fruit. So obviously Isaiah is saying that this future Messiah is going to have the fullness of God's Spirit upon him, is from the stock of Jesse. He is a, of the line of David. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, and I'll raise unto David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king, and shall de be deal wisely, and shall execute justice. And yes, he is called Jehovah our righteousness. But remember, the, the debate here is about, is Jesus the angel of the Lord? Jeremiah 38 and 9. I should come to pass in that day, saith Jehovah of hosts, that I'll break his yoke off from thy neck, and I will burst thy bonds. And strangers shall no more make him their bondmen, but they shall serve Jehovah their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Now we know that ultimately this is fulfilled when Jesus comes back, but it, it was partially fulfilled when Jesus arrived uh, at his first advent. Jeremiah 33, 24 through uh, 14 through 26, Jeremiah says, Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that I will perform that good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and concerning the house of Judah. And in those days, and at that time, I will cause a branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. So again, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, both echoing the promise made to David by Jehovah God. Now, um, is there something that we could add to the Davidic covenant? Because the Davidic covenant is specific to David's offspring. And there's no mention of an angel, that this Messiah would be uh, of angel stock. In fact, in Psalm 89, Jehovah says he will not alter the thing that has gone out of his lips. The covenant that he made with David will stand sure, and he will establish his seed forever. That's uh, Psalm 89, 33 through 37. So Jehovah God, when he gave the Davidic, made the covenant with David, he said in Psalm 89, he's not going to alter it. It is a firm covenant. This is... This means that this future Messiah is of the seed of David alone. Now, I know um, Trinitarians and people that believe Jesus is the angel of the Lord, they, they won't deny that. But when you say he's someone other than purely of the seed of David, then basically what you're doing is adding to that covenant. Ezekiel 34, 23 and 24. We know Jesus is our shepherd. Well, that, that shepherd language is connected to David in the Davidic covenant. Ezekiel 34, I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, Jehovah, will be their God, and my servant David, prince among them, I, Jehovah, have spoken it. And Ezekiel 37, 24 through 25, and my servant David shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my ordinances and observe my statutes and do them, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto my Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, they and their children, and their children's children forever. And David, my servant, shall be prince forever. We know that's talking about Jesus Christ, the eschatological David. Hosea, we get, now we got another prophet. Hosea 3, 1 through 5. And Jehovah said unto me, Go again, love a woman beloved of her friend, and an adulteress, even as Jehovah loveth the children of Israel, though they turn unto other gods, and love cakes and raisins. So I brought her to me, fifteen pieces of silver, and a homer of barley, and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for many days, and thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt be not be any man's wife, so I will be toward thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king and without prince, and without sacrifice, and without pillar, and without ephod or teraphim. And afterward the children of Israel will return and seek Jehovah their God and David their king. So we know that this is fulfilled in Jesus. 
Okay, what's fascinating, when we talk about Acts 15 and the conference to decide whether uh, the early believers had to keep the law, Moses gets circumcised, I'm talking about Gentile believers, a lot of uh, what's missed in that conference be with Paul and Barnabas coming to Peter, James, and John, the pillars of Jerusalem, is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Amos. So Amos says in Amos 9, 11 through 12, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I'll raise up its ruins, and I'll build it as in the days of old, that they may pro possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that are called by my name and Jehovah that do it this. Okay, so this is a prophecy of the restoration of the Davidic kingdom, which James, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, says is fulfilled by the Gentiles coming into the church. This is Acts 15, showing that Jesus is the Davidic king, that the Davidic kingdom has been rebuilt and restored, made up of Jews and Gentiles. And, and why is this? Because in Acts chapter 2, see, I believe the book of Acts is a template for how we are to preach the gospel. And when you go through the book of Acts, in every sermon, not once do they say that Jesus is an angel, but always without controversy, as Peter says, <clears throat> men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried in the sepulchres with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he'd raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen as before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So Psalm 132, 17, I believe, says that the, uh, the, the fruit of David's body would be the future restorer of, of God's purposes for Israel. Well, here we see Peter says without controversy that Jesus, by way of resurrection, is now on the throne of David, fulfilling the promise that God made to David that of the fruit of David's loins, one would be raised up to, to sit on his throne. So let's go to the book of Hebrews now. That's another opportunity for the author, for an author of the New Testament, just as Stephen had the opportunity, just as Jesus did, to connect Jesus with being the angel of the Lord. In fact, the whole purpose of Hebrews 1 is to disconnect Jesus from being an angel of any kind. Now, I know um, uh, uh, Trinitarians will say that, well, the angel of the Lord just isn't any angel. Well, this is the thing. Nowhere, like I said, nowhere do we have a thus saith the Lord connecting Jesus as being the angel of the Lord. But in Hebrews chapter 1, when the author of Hebrews says, not unto any angel has Jehovah said at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Well, we know that angels are created sons of God. So why hasn't an angel been told that thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? Why? Because that's royal Davidic covenant language. That is a Davidic um, coronation hymn of a Davidic king taken from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. And it's applied now to Jesus at the ascension into heaven, because Hebrews 1 is about his exaltation and ascension into heaven. Because God never authorized an angel to sit on the throne of David. That's why an angel's not told that. Because that throne, in that language, thou art my son this day have begotten thee, is reserved for the Davidic king, which Jesus is. Also, um, we actually have four Davidic quotations in Hebrews chapter 1, we have Psalm 110 quoted at the end. Again, the author of Hebrews saying, an angel is a ministering spirit. Okay, they appear as pillars of fire. They're like winds. Jesus is a human being, and he gets to sit on the throne of David because he's of the line of David. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews 2, it says that our, our, our Savior did not take on him the nature of angels. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 7, it says our Lord sprang from Judah. See, all this is confirming exactly everything the prophet said about the future messianic king. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, what's Paul's gospel centered on? His gospel centered on that Jesus is of the seed of David according to my gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, the resurrection of the dead and Jesus' identity as the seed of David. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, where uh, uh, Paul likens Peter to the rock that followed Israel in the wilderness, we know that Israel in the wilderness were given spiritual blessings. Uh, they are giving spiritual food and spiritual drink. But in no way is Paul saying that the rock is the angel of the Lord. Okay? So, again, we have to have two or three witnesses to have everything and something established. We have to have the prophets pr prophesying of this. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 21, what did Moses say? That this prophet that's coming, talking about Jesus, is going to be like you, brethren. He, he doesn't say he's going to be an angel. He's going to be of the children of Israel. Uh, Jesus is la just about his last words in the book of Revelation. I'm the bright and morning star, the offspring of David. 
Much of the language we see of Jesus used being the light of the world, the shepherd, is Davidic language. And see, this is why it's important, uh, I believe, to come to this truth that Jesus is who the prophet said he is, the seed of David, because guess what? Uh, clearly, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ isn't going to come back until the gospel's preached until all the world. And I believe this is foundational. As I mentioned, uh, Paul mentions that if we have another Jesus, we in essence have another gospel and another spirit. So again, we have none of the prophets prophesy of Jesus being the angel of the Lord, the future Messiah, sorry. None of the um, the New Testament writers, in fact, in Luke chapter 1, 26 through 36, the birth narrative of Jesus, the angel Gabriel confirms exactly what would be expected of an Israelite, that the Lord God Jehovah is going to give Jesus, Mary's son, the throne of his father, David. Simeon says a horn of salvation has been raised out of the house of David. So everyone in the New Testament confirms merely what is prophesied about by the prophets. We have a storyline from Genesis 3.15 to Revelation 22.16. And what it is, uh, God is showing us where this Messiah is going to come from. And then as time goes on in the Old Testament, it's narrowed down to exactly which lineage it's going to come from. And the New Testament writers, all they do is confirm it. Paul says it's gospel centered on Jesus being the seed of David. Um, and any other gospel, as he says in uh, Galatians, is accursed. Now, again, I'm not casting aspersions. We have all have a tumbleweed of doctrines that we have to uh, unwind. But it, we still have to love truth, and it still doesn't lessen the importance of uh, loving it, even if it goes against our traditions and what we've been raised in. I've had to uh, take off a lot of doctrines that I, I've, I held near and dear. But this doctrine of the Davidic covenant is central to the apostles' preaching. And again, not one time do you see anybody preaching the gospel and mentioning Jesus as being the angel of the Lord. Um, Acts chapter 13, Paul, he, he gives another dissertation uh, of the history of Israel, and he makes mention of Jesus being of the seed of David, a, a savior being raised up out of the house of David. And he quotes Psalm 2, 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Um, Psalm 110 is frequently alluded to in the New Testament, and that is a Davidic covenant prophecy. And again, the author of Hebrews is showing us that Jesus sat on the throne of David at his ascension in New Jerusalem. Hebrews 1, 5 and 6, Hebrews 1, 89, coming from Psalm 5, 45, uh, 5 and 6 which was a Davidic coronation hymn, sang about Solomon, and now applying to Jesus at the ascension into heaven. And we as the church, Jew and Gentile, are the restored Davidic kingdom, as prophesied by Amos, confirmed by James, the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, do I have any, uh, I'm good. I'm done. All right. Thank you, Solomon. And uh, for anyone who's who joined us late and you missed the beginning, uh, we are having a debate on the topic, is Jesus the angel of the Lord? We have uh, Anthony Rogers, who is a Trinitarian with the affirmative position. And we have, and we, <clears throat> sorry, I have a little cold here. Uh, and we have Solomon Ja Rodriguez, uh, who's a Unitarian representing the negative position. Um, so we're going to continue with the rebuttals now because we just finished our opening statements. And I do have to say to some of you in the chat, some of you are mean to anyone you disagree with who's speaking. Now, it's one thing to be mean to someone who's a jerk. Right? You guys are just mean to anyone you disagree with, right? I mean, think about it. I'm a diagnosed psychopath and you guys are meaner than I am. So it, now notice as, as far as as far as we've seen, Solomon seems like a really, really nice guy. So keep that in mind when you're posting your comments about disagreeing with him to keep in mind that he seems like a nice guy. He's not, you know, he's not being nasty or anything. All right. So let me get uh, Anthony, if you could unmute your microphone. Solomon, if you could mute your microphone, I will get Anthony up here with us. And uh, are you ready, Anthony? I'm ready. All right, let me get you up by yourself then. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a 15-minute rebuttal. So Anthony will give a 15-minute rebuttal, followed by a 15-minute rebuttal for Solomon. Just let me reset my timer here. Get Anthony up on the screen by himself. And Anthony, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, I want to begin by <clears throat> thanking Solomon. I do... A Again, appreciate to reiterate David's comment, uh, his his graciousness. He, he definitely conducts himself in a very uh, peaceable manner, 
so I do hope, uh, because I do want to be very pointed, not obviously harsh, but I do want to be pointed here, and I hope that nobody takes me, mistakes me for one of those mean commenters in the chat uh, co uh, log, <laughs> uh, being facetious. But uh, to be honest, I have to say, uh, I don't really know how much of his opening presentation uh, is even substantive and therefore requires much of a response. To be quite frank, that seemed like a long exercise in a false antithesis. Indeed, it even seems that Solomon at one point recognized that he was setting up a false antithesis. You notice that the vast majority of his time was spent laboring the point that Jesus was a descendant of David, which I perfectly agree with. Right. And he even admitted that. I know that Trinitarians will say this. Well, if you know Trinitarians will say this, then it seems to me you shouldn't be, uh, you know, laboring to make a point that Trinitarians would agree with. Of course, Jesus was a descendant of David, according to the flesh, as Paul says in Romans chapter one. He was a descendant of Israel, according to the flesh, as it says in Romans chapter nine. Uh, in fact, you even heard uh, Solomon say something that I think blows the lid off of the fallacy here. When Solomon quoted Jesus from Revelation 22, he quoted Jesus saying, I am the bright morning star, the offspring of David. But what does Jesus say there? The entirety of what Jesus says there. Jesus says, I am the root and offspring of David. So the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, and here's a witness, by the way, that doesn't require a second or a third. His witness is the witness of the Father, whose words he always speaks, as Solomon will agree. When he speaks, he speaks truth. So on the basis of Christ's own testimony, he is not merely a descendant of David. He is also the root of David. He is somebody who existed prior to David and was uh, the source of David's very life and existence. Uh, another fallacy that just riddled uh, his his presentation was pointing out certain passages where it doesn't talk about Jesus being the angel of the Lord, uh, as if the Bible needs to state something that's true in every place. Uh, but how fallacious is that? Is God omnipresent? Well, of course he is. David says he is in Psalm 139. Does that mean that it has to be stated in Luke 2, 1 in order for it to be true? Of course not. Uh, and even saying, well, it could have been brought up here, it would have been a good occasion to bring it up here, is in itself a refutation. It's just an argument from silence. If that's not the point that uh, the, the person speaking was trying to make, then it's irrelevant that he didn't make that point there. It doesn't overturn the fact that that point is made ever and anon elsewhere in Scripture. In fact, he talked about occasions when Jesus could have said it. There are actually occasions where Jesus did indicate it if you're steeped in the Old Testament. For example, according to the Old Testament, Genesis 18, the Lord himself appeared to Abraham with two other angels. The angel of the Lord appeared to Abram. But who was it that appeared to Abram? According to Jesus, he was that person who appeared to Abraham. In John chapter 8, when Jesus was in a protracted debate with the religious leaders, we're told they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. The antecedent here for the word this, what Abraham did not do, is try to kill Jesus. Jesus is saying, you are not a descent, you are not descendants of Abraham, because if you were, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. Abraham did not do this. He did not try to kill me. This is even further confirmed later in the chapters when the Jews are so agitated, they're, they're, they, they boil over and say, you're not yet 50 years old and, and you think you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, before Abraham became, I am. So very clearly, Jesus himself identifies himself not only as a descendant of David, but as the root of David, not only as a man who told the Jews the truth that he heard from God, but as one who existed and appeared to Abraham. Now, Solomon also mentioned that we need two or three witnesses. Well, my lens, how many witnesses did I give? And how many witnesses do I have to give before they'll be counted as two or three? I think I gave upwards of a dozen uh, evidences. But, but first off, I pointed out the exact analog to Jesus in the New Testament is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord is identified as God. Jesus is identified as God. The angel of the Lord is identified as pre-existent. Jesus is identified as pre-existent. The angel of the Lord is the one 
uh, who is distinguished from the Father and the Spirit as that redeeming person who rescued the people of God. That's what Jesus is said to do in distinction from the Father and the Spirit in the New Testament. The angel of the Lord is the one who appeared to men uh, as a man uh, and, and revealed God to men. Uh, and Jesus is the one who did that according to the New Testament. I also pointed out that the uh, all appearances of the angel of the Lord, which are strewn across the Old Testament, uh, that they completely come to a halt when Jesus becomes incarnate. If Jesus is not the angel of the Lord, where did the angel of the Lord go? It seems like he disappeared. He's missing in action. Oh, well, not if you recognize this, uh, this fact that I'm pointing out, that Jesus is in every way, according to the New Testament authors, what the angel of the Lord was according to the Old Testament. And I argued yet more. I pointed out that the New Testament says exactly about Jesus what the Old Testament says about the angel of the Lord. It was the angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses in Exodus 3 and told him to identify with him and his people and suffer their affliction. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, we're told that Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. He chose rather to experience the reproach of Christ rather than the treasures of Egypt. How does Moses suffer the reproach of Christ in affliction along with the people of God, which is echoing Exodus 3, unless he's saying that Jesus was there and was the angel of the Lord. Likewise, I pointed out that the, the New Testament identifies Jesus as the one who led them out of Egypt, the very thing attributed to the angel of the Lord, times without number in the Old Testament. I specifically mentioned Exodus 14, 19. I could have mentioned Judges 2, 1, uh, where the angel says that I'm the one who delivered you out of the land of Egypt, which, by the way, is an echo of the preface of the Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So the angel of the Lord claims to have been the one that did this for Israel. The apostle Paul explicitly says that was Jesus. It doesn't say, as Solomon said, that Jesus is likened to the rock. That's not what Paul says. Paul doesn't uh, you know, use that language here. Paul says that the rock that followed them was Christ. And then later in the context, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9, he says, uh, you know, do not test Jesus or do not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. So Paul says they tested Christ in the wilderness and he destroyed them by sending fiery serpents among them. Jude in Jude 1, 5 says that Jesus led the people out of the land of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. Again, the same thing attributed to the angel of the Lord. And I said yet more. I pointed out that the prophets anticipate the, the future redemption to be modeled after the prior redemption. What God was doing in the past by means of the angel of the Lord and his spirit is what God was going to do in the future in a more exalted way, in a greater, more definitive way. He was going to accomplish eternal redemption, the exodus of God's people. Both terms that are used for Jesus, what he did in the New Testament, Hebrews 9, as well as uh, uh, Luke 9.31, it says that he was going to accomplish his exodus at Jerusalem. Uh, but more than that, I pointed out that new exodus passages that talk about that future redemption are explicitly applied to Jesus in the New Testament. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Isaiah speaks of a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, Jehovah, so the coming one is Jehovah, and that same prophecy is picked up by Malachi, who, who borrows some of the same language. So he's tying it in with Isaiah's prophecy. And he says, he quotes the Lord saying, Behold, I'll send my messenger before my face. He'll prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek uh, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. How much more explicit can it get? That's the very word for angel in Hebrew. The Melach Habarit, the angel of the covenant. I also pointed out that as ancient Jews recognized, and this is not just something that it takes, uh, you know, me pointing out that Jews said this, I could make this point quite apart from them, but it's still fascinating that they recognized it, but they recognized that the term wonderful used as a name of the Messiah is an exclusive divine title. It's used for God alone or for things that God does in the Old Testament. The only one we see arrogating this title to himself is the angel of the Lord in Judges 13, when he said to Manoah, my name is wonderful. So very clearly the Jews said, hey, this is the same person. This is the one that's going to accomplish the future exodus. He is in fact the angel. Now, let me go back to some of these passages that Solomon cited trying to establish the 
the lineal descent of Jesus because they're actually interesting. Uh, he, he didn't start with David, although that's where he put most of his emphasis. He actually started with Genesis 3.15. What's interesting here is that Eve seemed to have had a much more, uh, you know, in, uh, exalted understanding of who that future redeemer would be. When Genesis 3:15 says that God will send or give a seed to the woman, right, and He will crush the head of the serpent, accomplish redemption. Eve understood that quite clearly as a messianic prophecy, like Solomon and I both do. But she also thought that the coming one would be God Himself. And I bring this up, and, and here's the proof of that. Because in Genesis 4.1, which is often mistranslated, but you can go online and look at, there, there are multiple accurate translations. But the literal Hebrew says, when she gave birth to Cain, she believed this was the promised child. It was a premature uh, judgment. She jumped the gun, but she thought this was the fulfillment. She said, I have gotten a man, the Lord. That's the literal Hebrew of the text. She thought that the child that was born to her was God himself. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, of course, because the angel of the Lord is free frequently called God in the Old Testament, but as well, once again, the Jews bring in their testimony here because according to the Targum of this verse, it says that she said, I have gotten a man, the angel of the Lord. They saw that as an equivalent expression for the Lord himself. So uh, e even when we look at these passages about the bio or the, 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 the lineage of Jesus, uh, these, uh, these passages seem to indicate far more than Solomon is seeing. And certainly we see explicit statements to this effect in the prophets that I had already mentioned. Now, uh, uh, Solomon said, uh, you know, Hebrews 1 refutes the idea that Jesus is an angel. I already made it very clear that the term angel is a functional term, and only in context does it give us any kind of connotation about what kind of being is in view. When the angel of the Lord is in view, it's not talking about any created angel like the author of Hebrews 1 is talking about, and Hebrews 2. Uh, certainly, I agree Jesus is not an angel in that sense. In fact, those are created angels, as Solomon would admit. They're commanded to worship the Son, something scripture says to do only to God, but was done to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, Exodus 3, Judges 6, numerous passages. Uh, very clearly, uh, the author of Hebrews is not speaking about the angel of the Lord. In fact, he doesn't use that phrase, which is distinctive in the Old Testament. It's a distinct uh, verbal construction, or excuse, it's a distinct construction in the Hebrew, and it's distinguished from all other uses of the word angel. The angel of the Lord is God, not a creature. The author of Hebrews could just as well have said and been exactly correct with the Hebrew. He could have said, "For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are the angel of the Lord? To which of the angels did he ever say, you are God? To which of the angels did he ever say, uh, you are to be worshipped? No, there's only one. There's only one. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ according to the New Testament. So over and over again, numerous witnesses, the entire panoply of Scripture, the drift of Scripture points to Jesus as the angel of the Lord, that divine person who uh, enacted the redemption of Israel and was going to come in the future and do a yet more marvelous work uh, in the future. Um, uh, there are a few other things that he said. I mean, I just, uh, uh, you know, I'm uh, struggling even with this to think there, there's, uh, there was something to respond to. And again, I'm not trying to be, be harsh. I'm just trying to be faithful to the text and faithful to everybody that's listening to me so that you can hear the truth and come to the truth. Jesus is that divine person. He came in the flesh. This is the glory of our redemption, that it wasn't merely a creature who came into this world like all the rest of us do. It was God's own son, the eternal angel of the covenant, the messenger of the covenant. He came. He gave himself for us. He offered himself up on the cross. When scripture says God so loved the world, it's not saying Oh, God loved the world that he created a person and let him die. It's saying that the very beloved son, his eternal son, who has always been with him, the object of his eternal affection, the co-sharer of his essence and glory, that person known in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, that person is the one that he gave on our behalf. That truly bespeaks the love of God. For God so loved the world that he did not merely give a descendant of David, but that he gave as a descendant of David the divine son, the eternal angel of the covenant. That person is the one that he gave. And I'll conclude with that. Wow, you guys are uh, being really good with time so far. 
feel like I normally have to be, you know, start cutting people off and so on. All right, well, let me get, let's see, let me get Solomon back on with us. And uh, Anthony, if you could mute your mic, Solomon, if you could turn your mic on. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, hear you perfectly. Right. And my timer is reset. Let me get you back up on the screen by yourself. And Solomon, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, we have to remember this debate isn't so much about whether the angel of the Lord is divine, or whether Jesus is divine, or whether Jesus is God, or whether the Trinity is true. I am a biblical Unitarian, but this this debate here is specifically to whether Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Now, Anthony mentions, and like I mentioned before, that I know Trinitarians do not deny Jesus being the seed of David. The reason why I went over all those verses because there's a there's a theme throughout the Old Testament of where the Messiah would come from. And when you go to the, the ministry of Jesus, Jesus himself never, and again, I'm not arguing, the argument isn't whether Jesus is claiming to be God, Jehovah, but the argument is, is Jesus the angel of the Lord? And Jesus not one time identifies himself with that. As a matter of fact, uh, the whole John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am, well, we see the gospel in Abraham. We see Genesis, like I said, Genesis 22, and Abraham offering up Isaac, and the angel of Jehovah calling out to Abraham to stop. Uh, and we see this being a picture of the gospel, because what Isaac is called Abraham's only begotten son, Hebrews 11, 17. Well, I have no argument with Anthony that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. There's no argument there. The question is, again, if, and Anthony agrees with me, the identity of Jesus is crucial to our understanding of the gospel. The angel of the Lord, yes, that same angel that, that appeared to Moses in the bush was the same angel that led them out of Egypt, led them through the Red Sea, followed them in the wilderness, and brought them into the land of Canaan. It's the same angel that they provoked and by you know disobeying him in the land of Canaan and compromising with the idols of the land. It's the same angel they provoked in the wilderness. Okay, and that angel, Isaiah 63, if anything, Isaiah 63, 9 through 13, if you're going to identify the angel of the Lord or the angel of Jehovah with, with anyone, it wouldn't be Jesus because the angel of Jehovah actually has a closer, in Isaiah uh, 63, 9 through 14, the term angel of his presence, the Spirit of the Lord, angel of the Lord. It's it's So if anything, the angel of the Lord would be more the Holy Spirit than Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, you see uh, Philip being prompted by the, uh, the angel of the Lord. So I know Anthony mentions that the angel of the Lord disappears after the resurrection of Christ, but I see him in Acts chapter 8. Maybe he knows of something I don't, but in Acts chapter 8, the angel of the Lord appears, prompts Philip to preach the gospel to the Ethiopian. And what is the what is the Ethiopian reading? Isaiah 53, another text that talks about a human servant of Jehovah suffering and offering himself for the sins of his people. And then at the end of that discourse, what did you see the Spirit of the Lord come and take Philip away? So you see there a close connection between the Spirit of the Lord and the angel of the Lord. So if anything, if you're going to identify one of the three persons of the Trinity with anybody, you have a much closer identification with the Holy Spirit to the angel of the Lord, then you do Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Again, I'm not a Trinitarian, but I'm saying if you're a Trinitarian, that would be the closer identification. Um, as far as uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 5, in my, you know, I have the King James, it says the Lord. That definitely is the Father, in, in my view. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, um, and, and Trinitarians do this, or anybody who has more of a pre-existent view, they make a separate category of angels. Well, the Bible just talks about angels, humans, and of course, God. Um, so this arbitrary creating of a, another category of angels, as, like the special angel of the Lord, again, it's just arbitrary and speculation. And that's what I argue this idea of Jesus being the angel of the Lord is. You know, you're, you're getting statements that Jesus says or statements that are said about Jesus that indicate preexistence. And now you have to go on a search for Jesus in the Old Testament. We, we can't be random about it. So if you're going to believe Jesus is preexistent, and you're going to find him in the Old Testament, you have to have, like I said, a thus saith the Lord, and there isn't one. And it is important that these things are made clear in the Scriptures, um, because then we can come up with a, a numerable amount of doctrines. There are people that say that Jesus is Melchizedek, because you could read about the story of Melchizedek appearing to Abraham, 
and how Melchizedek is spoken about in the book of Hebrews. And there's people say Jesus is Melchizedek. There's people that say Jesus is God Almighty in the Old Testament. Again, we cannot speculate. We have to, what are the prophets saying? What did the, the, the witnesses in the New Testament say? What did Jesus, Jesus himself say? Himself say, if you go to Jesus' ministry, the whole controversy, the whole time, even upon uh, his trial before the high priest Caiaphas, even at the cross when he was getting mocked by the onlookers, and what was above his cross? That he is the king of the Jews. That's the, that's the controversy between Jesus and the religious establish of Israel, re religious establishment of Israel, him being the king, him being the king of Israel, which they knew would come from the line of David. Um, uh, Anthony mentions about in Malachi the the angel of the covenant. Well, we know that angel also means messenger. Okay, it's not there, it's not just a uh, something. It could be I could be an angel and in a sense a messenger of God's uh, gospel. Okay, so we can't take one verse in, in, in Malachi and then totally uh, pull the rug out from under what the prophets have been saying uh, since this thing was promised to David that they, it would come out of David's offspring. So yeah, the reason why. I went through all those passages proving that he's of the seed of David because I believe the truth exposes falsehood. For example, we all hear this at the bank when they to to expose a counterfeit, they look at the true $20 bill. So that's exactly what I believe I was doing is looking at the true $20 bill to show exactly who the Bible says Jesus would be in the Old Testament confirmed in the New, what Jesus says about himself and that exposes the falsehood that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Now I know, I used to believe that too. I know that it's something that I believe a lot of Christians grow up assuming, but when you look at it with a, a fine tooth comb, the evidence for Jesus being the angel of the Lord is wanting. Now in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, uh, he's called the wonderful counselor, and I know the angel of the Lord, Jehovah, appeared to, uh, to, to um, Samson's parents, and they called him wonderful, seeing his name as wonderful. I mean, that again, he can't, overturn all the evidence in scripture about who Jesus would be just because two words are used of one for the angel of the Lord appearing to Manoah, and then that word is used in Isaiah prophesying of the future Davidic king. The importance to remember is Isaiah 9, 1 through 7 is a Davidic covenant passage. And so, and again, uh, as Paul warned, you know, we have to stay rooted in the simplicity of Christ. And I think we muddle the message when we attribute Christ to being something other than what Scripture over and over again confirms. We go to the words of Jesus, it's found wanting. We go to the apostles and they're preaching in the book of Acts, it's found wanting. Not one evidence of Jesus being of the angel of the Lord. And in the Old Testament, yes, again, the, the argument isn't whether the angel of the Lord is this special angel. I do believe the angel of the Lord, Jehovah, was a special angel because it's the same angel again from the burning bush all the way to the land of Canaan. I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing whether the angel is divine or not. The argument's not even whether Jesus is divine. And just for clarification, because I saw some of the comments, I do worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my king. First Chronicles 29, Israel worshiped David their king and Jehovah their God. And how much more Jesus, the, uh, the end times David. So again, um, the angel of the Lord does is definitely a special angel. Me and Anthony are in agreement with that. Again, the argument is not whether uh, that angel is divine, but it's whether that angel is Jesus. If there's a one-to-one -one match, and there's just no one in Scripture that that makes that identification. It's now we can, like I said, you could piece together verses uh, of Jesus, you know, indicating pre-existence with the activity of the angel. But again, that's merely an assumption and it's speculation. And uh, I think dangerous speculation, uh, again, not uh, casting any aspersions. We've all uh, have things we believe that we have to fine tune. But nonetheless, um, the angel of the Lord, Jehovah, is very active in the, the Old Testament. We see him active again in Acts chapter 8. Uh, we see Stephen even says in, his, uh, in Acts chapter 7 that the Israel, they do resist the Holy Spirit like their fathers did. Well, that Holy Spirit in Isaiah 63 9 through 14, is identified as the angel of God's presence, the angel of the Lord. So, if, like I said, if anything, there's a closer identification of the angel of the Lord being the Holy Spirit than there is of being Jesus. And this is where I depart from my Unitarian brethren who believe the Holy Spirit is non-personal uh, and only the power of God. I do believe that the angel of Jehovah is the Holy Spirit. And I believe that Jesus is, again, the seed of David. 
and I believe Jehovah is the one true God, him alone, the Father. And, and again, you know, Anthony is connecting a lot of scriptures, which is what I would have done back in my uh, Trinitarian days. But when you, like I said, when you look at it closer and you, then you get the real $20 bill, you see that the counterfeit, it, it doesn't measure up. It doesn't measure up. Uh, again, uh, the rock, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul never identifies the rock as that angel. Now you can make that connection. You can guesstimate it. But again, do we have a thus say it the Lord? Do, and I know Paul uh, Anthony says he has the two or three witnesses required, but we don't have two or three witnesses saying, point blank, Jesus was that angel that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Jesus himself doesn't say that. Jesus never in his ministry, and he said he had given the apostles everything that the Father had given him. I would think it would be important for Jesus to tell the apostles that he was that angel. But no, what does he tell the apostles over and over again? What is it? That, that makes Caiaphas irate. Jesus quotes Daniel 7, 13, and 14. He is that son of man brought before the ancient of days to receive a kingdom, which I believe was fulfilled at the ascension of Christ into heaven. And the book of Hebrews describes that. That's why they get irate. They get irate and accuse him of blasphemy because he's claiming to be the son of man, the Davidic king uh, that's going to come back one day and consummate his kingdom on the earth. So that the con you look at the controversy of Jesus' ministry— Nothing about him being the angel of the Lord. Again, when he says, I am, before Abraham was, we know that he's a slain, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We know that Abraham saw his day and was glad. What day did Abraham see? That out of his seed, many nations will be blessed. Okay, out of Abraham's seed. And that was fulfilled in Christ. We see the gospel in Genesis 22, Abraham offering up Isaac. Everything that's a type of Jesus in the Old Testament has to do with human beings. Um, and the salvation program of God, you know, uh, Anthony mentioned that, uh, you know, this angel is that type of that salvation program. I submit to you that that salvation program that's a type of Jesus is through the Davidic dynasty. That David, just as he is the shepherd leading Israel uh, to pastor in and out, we see that in Jesus. He is our shepherd. David's the king. Jesus is our king. David was a Messiah. Je Jesus is the Messiah. Um, so we see David, this fierce warrior king. Well, Jesus is going to be that when he comes back. Revelation 19, Isaiah 63, the breaker of Basra. So again, it's the salvation program through David, the light of the world. The Davidic dynasty was to be a lamp unto Jerusalem. Uh, as I mentioned, the bright and morning star, those are all, uh, that's all language that is used of the Davidic dynasty. And I think what happens is the fruit of saying that Jesus is the angel of the Lord is in the fact that rarely in churches do you hear about Jesus being the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the seed of David, because what happens is it obscures his true identity. So that's why I had to go to the real $20 bill and talk about the seed of David, which I know Trinitarians don't deny, because it exposes the false $20 bill of Jesus being an angel. Even if you try to make that category of an angel separate from the created angels, it still doesn't prove it's Jesus because nobody identifies Jesus as that angel. Nobody makes the connection. Stephen, again, in, in Acts 7, he is like two ships passing through the wind. And, and, and like I said, Jesus never identifies himself in that. And I think if you, if you go with the words of Jesus, you see how the apostles preach in the book of Acts, not once mentioning that he is the angel, but always that he's the son of God, always he's the Christ of God, that he's the servant of God, Acts 3.13, but never an angel. Why? Because... They know what the prophets say. When when Paul had to prove to the Bereans that Jesus was the Christ, he, he likely had to go to the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, uh, Zechariah. Uh, he had to go to the Davidic covenant. I don't know if he would have been able to prove that Jesus was Messiah by saying he's the angel of the Lord. In Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis, uh, you know, you have the, 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 the Jehovah on earth raining down fire and brimstone from Jehovah out of heaven. Again, that doesn't prove that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. That is the debate. It's not whether Jesus is Jehovah, whether he is a divine, and by the way, I believe he's divine, or whether he is God. The debate is, is he the angel of the Lord? And the evidence is wanting. It's just not there. I mean, I, I do see where uh, someone could get scriptures in the, the New Testament indicating preexistence and matching them up with the angel. But again, that's not how we should read scripture. That's not how we should understand doctrine. And um, how many more minutes do I have, David? 45 seconds. So that's, again, that's why I went with the, the, the seed of David lineage, because 
I'm going to the real to expose the counterfeit. And, um, and because at the end of the day, you know, Jesus being the angel of the Lord, I just need to see it clearly. It, it can't be something that we piece together, one scripture here, one scripture here, and just make our best guess. It has to be firm and solid. Jesus has to say it, the apostles have to say it, the prophets, and it's just not there. And I'm done. All right. And we've got Anthony back up now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you're uh, tuning in late, we're having a debate on the topic, is Jesus the angel of the Lord? We finished our opening statements and our first rebuttals, and we're moving on to a period of cross-examination. Now, sometimes there could be trouble in cross-examination if people are you know, trying to talk over each other or yelling. Um, but Solomon seems like a nice guy. Anthony can be nice or mean, depending on he'll adapt. He'll adapt to uh, to his opponent. So I don't I don't actually anticipate any problems here. So I'm actually going to get off the screen. And so for this period of of cross examination, David, what's that? What's up? I just want to make one clarification because I saw a comment. I'm not a modalist. I'm a Unitarian, so I'm not a modalist at all. Okay. So uh, during the first 10 minute period of cross-examination, Anthony will be primarily asking questions and uh, Solomon will be primarily answering questions about his position and then we'll reverse it to where Solomon is, is primarily asking questions and Anthony will be primarily uh, answering questions. So I'm going to go ahead and get myself off the screen. Both of you guys ready? Yes. All right, let me, yes. let me just get you guys up here. All right, you two are up, and you'll have 10 minutes whenever you're ready with your first question, Anthony. Okay, uh, so some of my questions are just points of clarification for my uh, next installment uh, rebutting things you've said. I don't want to refute a straw man. Uh, I think I know why people in the chat were thinking you might be a modalist, because you said you're a Unitarian, but in one of your closing comments there a second ago, you said, I do believe Jesus is divine. Can you explain what you mean by saying Jesus is divine? Well, I believe the Father, the Father's glory dwells in Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, Hebrews. So I believe is, the is Father it, dwells in Jesus. His 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 uh his spirit dwells in Jesus. Is it, that is it an eternal glory or something that Jesus possessed subsequent to his resurrection? I believe it's. I believe Jesus had the Father dwelling in him from the time of his baptism onwards. Okay. Um, I believe Jesus died a real death. He was dead. I don't believe part of him was in heaven or a part of him was in the grave. I believe he died a real death. I believe when he resurrected and ascended, okay, I believe that's fine. he was given a he was given so, eternal so you, glory. So you believe he didn't exist before the virginal conception, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, now you said at one point that I was making an arbitrary distinction between the angel of the Lord and angels in other contexts. Uh, do you recognize? Uh, well, this is why I'm confused. Because you said it was an arbitrary distinction, but then you admitted later that the word messenger can just refer to a human being. So the term has no ontological import, right? It doesn't tell you what kind of being is being talked about. You're correct. Okay, thank you. So it wasn't an arbitrary distinction I was making. Uh, you, you said that, uh, if anything, the angel of his presence in Isaiah 63 is the Holy Spirit. Would you also agree in that context that the angel of the Lord is also referred to as the Lord's glorious arm, his right arm? Yes, that brought them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. Okay, so the angel of the Lord is identified as his arm. I just want to be clear on that. Uh, uh, I'll have something to say about that in a bit. Uh, in John 8, when, uh, uh, when Jesus said that Abraham didn't try to kill him, what occasion was he referring to? When, in John 8, when Abraham, when Jesus said Abraham wasn't trying to. Hello? Hello? I don't know what happened to my headphones. Maybe they died. Um, yeah, so in John 8, uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, you're trying to kill me. If you were Abraham's children, you wouldn't do this. Abraham didn't do this. He didn't try to kill me. That's the upshot of the Greek. The antecedent of the word this refers back to the act of trying to kill him. And so Jesus is saying Abraham didn't try to kill him. The uh, the Jews were. So that's proof they're not children of Abraham. So what well, was that? Jesus, that's uh, Jesus. Obviously, when he's talking about before Abraham, I was before Abraham was I am. Um, uh, Jesus was not 
at physically there. He's talking about. So, so then how did Abraham try to kill him? Was he there just as a, an idea? Well, you, Abraham, are you talking about the, with Abraham and Isaac? Isaac and was a type I, of Jesus. I'm just asking about in, in yeah. John 8, uh, 39, uh, Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, I'm a man who told you the truth, which I heard from God, but you are seeking to kill me. Abraham did not do this. Abraham didn't try to kill me. That's the antecedent of the word this. So when did Abraham try to kill Jesus if Jesus didn't exist before his conception? Well, uh, uh, there's no uh, there's no story in the Bible of Abraham trying to kill Jesus. I mean, there is the there's the the type of the gospel of Abraham putting I ready to sacrifice Isaac, a type of would, Jesus. Would you agree that uh, the Lord himself appeared, the angel of the Lord appeared to Abram in Genesis 18 and Genesis 22 and other places? The Jehovah did. Okay. Uh, well, it says the angel of the Lord in Genesis 22 explicitly. Right. Right. Okay. So yes. he encountered the angel of the Lord. Okay. Thank you. That'll just that'll, that'll be tied into. Yeah. The angel called to Abraham to to prevent the killing of Isaac. Okay. Uh, you said that uh, Jesus is going to be the breaker of Basra. Is that correct? Yes. And what is what do you have in mind there when you say that? Well. He's the one that's going to come well, back. What, we know that. What passage are you referring to? I know uh, it's, Isaiah 63. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. Again, I'll tie that into my rebuttal. Um, you said that every, uh, you know, you mentioned counterfeit a number of times. Uh, and of course, every counterfeiter, you know, swears that his dollar is the real thing. Uh, but would you agree that, uh, and you were referring to the fact that I, you're saying that Jesus is the, of the seed of David because that's the real bill. Uh, would you agree that uh, bills, all bills have two sides to them? Yes. I'm just, I'm just trying to pick up an analogy here. Okay. Uh, so um, you also mentioned Genesis 1924, Jehovah from Jehovah. So you really believe that Jehovah rained fire from Jehovah, according well, to? Well, I know that I know that people uh, understand that. Some people say that's just one Jehovah there, talking about just Jehovah God. Some people believe there were two beings, one there getting the fire from heaven. So what probably believe? the angel that appeared to Abraham. Okay, Probably the so, angel. So the angel of the Lord rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Perfect. Could Thank have been. No, I didn't um, say it was. I wasn't there, so I don't know. Okay. Um, well, but it doesn't yeah. say Jesus. Right. Well, of course, Jesus isn't given that name until the New Testament, yeah. but we'll, we'll come back to all that. Um, do you know what the Messiah is called in Isaiah 53.1? Um, not off the top of my head, no. What is he called? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll connect that later. I, I don't want to... Uh, waste time um the word wonderful can you give me any example of that word being used for anyone other than god um no, i just have isaiah, isaiah 9 6 and 7 and uh, of course uh it's used uh, samson's parents they uh, use it for who? the parents of the angel of the jehovah to samson's parents okay. it's used there the term is used throughout the old testament for god himself or what god does he alone is wonderful he alone performs right. wonders Okay, so that's a okay. So you grant that? Um, well, I don't grant that. I just don't. I mean, I you don't, I don't know of any think that proves anything of the right. Jesus is the angel of the Lord because that's that's the proof. That's the debate. Remember? Uh, yeah. Well, the debate is okay. Well, well, I'll talk about that in my rebuttal. Um, so, but you grant that you have no counterexample to the word wonderful being used of anyone other than a divine person besides Isaiah nine six. Um, in Jude one five, you said you disagreed with the. Uh, reading that's found in almost every critical edition of the New Testament, whether you're talking about the Tyndale House Greek New Testament, uh, UBS 4, NA 28, uh, you name it, it's uh, all of them say Jesus is the one who led them out of Egypt. You said it refers to the, it, just it's the Lord, and that's referring to the Father. Who is the Lord according to the immediately prior uh, preceding verse in Jude 1 4? Jude 1 4, for there's, it mentions both the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ in Jude 1 4. Uh, well, can you read the verse then? Yeah, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so you're uh, again, you're using the, the King James. Okay, so I'll address that in the rebuttal period. I think that's good for me. I'll, I'll conclude with that because I only have eight minutes to rebut and there's already a lot to rebut there. All right, so uh, let me reset my timer here.
So now we'll have 10 minutes of uh, Solomon asking questions of Anthony. You can start whenever you're ready, Solomon. Okay, so <clears throat> you mentioned before that the, the talking about salvation as the, the angel of the Lord, of course, being used as God's arm of salvation in the, um, in the Old Testament and relating that to Jesus. Um, do you not see that also, uh, God using David and his his royal family as you as exercising that same uh, salvation program and in, in, for Israel. Are you asking if David is ever called the arm of the Lord? I'm talking about the, the David is David being a type of Jesus. Is he ever used as being someone to save Israel, to deliver Israel? Is he a deliverer? Yeah. God uses David uh, to affect certain temporal deliverances, sure, but he's never called the, the Redeemer of Israel. He's never called the Arm of the Lord. He's certainly never called the Angel of the Lord or God or any of those things. Right. Well, he wouldn't be the Angel of the Lord because right. he's not. And just, you know, again, well, so what I, what I want to clarify. So you said, let's go back to Genesis in the Sodom and Gomorrah episode. Do mm -hmm. you believe that's Jehovah God himself? Or do you believe Wait. there's there's a there's some? Do you believe that's two Jehovahs being spoken of? And I, I know what the I, Trinitarians believe. I'm not saying two beings called Jehovah. So do you believe that's two persons of Jehovah in Genesis 19? Uh, absolutely. The uh, the text says Jehovah rained fire and brimstone from Jehovah. It uses the preposition from, and it even has the direct object marker there in Hebrew, indi indicating a subject object distinction. Jehovah, the subject, rained fire from Jehovah, the object of the sentence. So there's a very clear subject-object distinction, just like if I give you a ball or you re I receive a ball from you, there's a subject-object distinction there. And that was also recognized by ancient Jews. When they identified who that Lord was on earth, they called him the Memra or the Logos. It was the Word who rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. So that's my understanding uh, so of that. So in Jesus' birth narrative, can you give a birth story of Jesus? We have two of them, where there's any indication of any type of pre-existent being being incarnated in Mary. Well, the in, two in the birth first, narratives. Yeah. What in, would you point out from those two sto two stories that would indicate a pre-existent being was incarnated in Mary? Well, quite it's quite easy. But but first, let me make a, an observation. It's it's fallacious to limit it to those two texts, obviously. Uh, because if they're focused on his birth, they don't have to be talking about his prior history. Uh, Paul himself in Galatians 4.4, 4, speaking of Christ's conception, says that in, in the fullness of time came, God sent out his son made of a woman. This assumes his prior existence to be sent out to be made of a woman, because the same thing is said about the spirit in the next uh, two verses. It says, then God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Just like the Spirit existed before he was sent out, so likewise the, the Son existed before he was sent out. So Paul clearly indicates the pre-existence of Jesus. He also does in the passages that I mentioned before, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through right. 4, but, uh, and what? many other passages. But you want the birth narrative, just go to Matthew 1. In Matthew 1, Matthew says that the birth, the conception of Jesus, is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy uh, that uh, a, the woman would conceive and give birth to a child, and they would call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He goes on to explain this is precisely why he's given the name Jesus, which means Jehovah saves, because, and this is emphatic in the Greek, because he, he's called Jehovah saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Okay. This is the fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy. He is God okay. with us, as God, he's eternal. You mentioned Galatians 4, in the fullness of time. Right. God sent forth his son. Right. When did Jesus say the time was fulfilled? Uh, at his baptism, but uh, Paul exactly. in Galatians 4 is talking about uh, God sending forth his son made of a woman. So he's not talking about the baptism. So Jesus existed prior right. but to when was Jesus sent to start? When was Jesus sent to start preaching the gospel of the kingdom? When did his ministry of preaching the gospel begin? When did, in, Acts, in the book of Acts, when they identify... Jesus being sent with the gospel, what is the beginning point that they identify that at? Right. So if we're talking about the beginning point of the, the gospel uh, proclamation that the kingdom is near, Mark 1, 15, that begins subsequent to Jesus' baptism, temptation, when he begins preaching. Okay, but if you're asking about what Paul was referring to in Galatians well, That's what Paul's 4, referring to because, again— Paul says God sent forth his son made of a woman. He does not say— uh, 
God sent forth his son after his baptism. That's but was Jesus was said. Jesus preaching the gospel after he was born as a baby? Uh, but that's irrelevant. Paul says no. God sent forth his son made of a woman. He's talking about well, his the, conception. The fullness of time was, again, Daniel 9, 27, right? The, the, the 70 week prophecy, the anointing of the most holy connects to Jesus' baptism. And that's when Jesus says the time is fulfilled. Yeah, so there, God sent no forth his son made of a woman. So the making of a woman is first. He's born. Then he sends forth his son. But you've got obviously he would, but he's yeah. identified as being he's identified as being sent forth. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, you, I can barely hear you, but let order, me just finish. You're swapping the order of the verse, just so you know. Okay, so in Galatians 4, the, the, all right, let's I'll just go there just to make sure that. The time is at hand, Jesus says, when he's baptized, he says, the time is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. He's made of a woman. We know that was 30 years prior. And he's identified in the book of Acts as being sent unto Israel after yep. the baptism at the Jordan yeah, River. Question. Or did you want to read the verse? So in, in the book of Daniel, there's a prophecy, a 70-week prophecy, the anointing of the Most Holy. When was Jesus anointed? At his baptism. So when Jesus says the time is fulfilled, he's not just making an arbitrary statement. He's showing us that he's fulfilling this. He's fulfilling the beginning of the 70th week, the anointing of the most holy. And that's precisely when the, in the book of Acts that identifies him as being sent by God. That's when he sent. So when Paul says he's made of a woman, we all know he was made of a woman. Well, as he Paul said, indicates no preexistence there. Zero the preexistence. But he's go ahead. I'm sorry. You're going off on a lecture. Uh, it's not rebuttal time. You have either to ask me a question or set up a question. Uh, the text itself does not say he was made of a woman and then God sent him forth at his baptism. It says that he was sent out from ex apostelene. It's an exceptionally strong term in Greek. He was sent out from God, made of a woman, made under the law. The same thing is said about the spirit. The spirit was sent out, ex apostelene, into our hearts. Just like the spirit existed before he entered into our hearts, so likewise the Messiah existed before he was made of a woman. That's the consistent usage of the term in the context, as well as fits the fact that it's an exceptionally strong term. So well, while it's certainly true that the uh, uh, the times that Jesus declared the fulfillment to be upon them uh, began when he was announcing the gospel of the kingdom, uh, but it's not true to, to smuggle that into Galatians 4 and then swap the order of the verse and say that he was made of a woman and then he was sent forth by God. That's not the order of the verse, and those two contexts aren't the same thing. Well, the fullness of time is the fulfillment of prophecy. And we do have a prophecy do we have that a prophecy Jesus will be anointed. Do we have mm -hmm. a prophecy about the virgin birth? Isaiah, what is that? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Yeah. Is that before the baptism? Well, yeah, but Jesus... So something, when, so something when they was, talk about Jesus being sent something in the book was of Acts, it's something precisely was marked out at the Jordan River. Right. So, so you admit that there was something that was prophesied and fulfilled before Christ's baptism and announcing the the uh, kingdom. Absolutely. When he was born, okay. we see we Very see. Good. And what was said when he was born? I'm satisfied that I answered your question. <laughs> okay. How many how many minutes do we have left? Two minutes. Okay. So, <clears throat> other than the birth narratives. And Galatians 4, where else would you spot a, a, a evidence that a pre-existent being was incarnated into Mary? You said other than what? Other than, because you mentioned Galatians 4, so you're using that. We In the birth narratives, obviously, we don't have any indication of that. Where else would you go? Well, of course we do. I, gave, I also gave Matthew 1, where he's identified as Emmanuel, God with us, or Jehovah saves. Uh, so, but... Uh, but so that in addition to that, I pointed out in my opening presentation, he's called Aviad, the possessor of eternity, meaning that quality is his possession. He possesses the quality of everlastingness. Who gave Isaiah him that? Six. Who gave him that? Huh? Who it doesn't gave matter. Jesus that? That's, that's irrelevant. You're asking about any indication of Jesus being preexistent. If you want to say it was given, it doesn't say it was given. Uh, there's no text that says that he is, is he was made to be Aviad. That, John, that's, five, John chapter 5 said that the, he, the father gave him. You're confusing context, but but that's not talking about the same thing. Uh, he says the Father has given the Son to have life in Himself, right? But that's right. Uh, we and what kind of life it. is that? Uh, well, it, it depends. There, there are a number of different ways that one could could look at this. First of all, 
Jesus is identified as the word at the beginning of the gospel, and it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's okay. why he's described there as you the know, creator of the world. Which where is he identified as the angel? Because I, the, word I, I, is, you, the, word, you, the word is a different subject than the angel. But now, well, now you're switching the question. I'm happy to answer that, but, okay. but you're acting like I was supposed to be answering that. That wasn't your original question. Sorry. Your question was about existence. Yeah, I, I gave numerous examples in my opening statement and in my refutation, my first rebuttal, where he, Jesus is identified as the angel of the Lord. Uh, and then I'll rebut what you said in just a minute uh, here. So I'll, re I'll be reminding you of what those were. Okay. All right. I actually have myself muted there. <laughs> uh, so, yep, all I was saying was that we are uh, moving on to our period of uh, second rebuttal. So, everyone ready? Yes. Um, I am ready. All right. Anthony, you are on the screen. So, you have eight minutes whenever you're ready to begin, sir. All right. Well, in an effort to argue that Jesus is not the angel of the Lord, Solomon has argued that the Holy Spirit is the angel of the Lord, or at least is a better candidate for that. Uh, and since Jesus is not the Holy Spirit, it would follow that Jesus would not be the angel of the Lord, if that's true. However, his argument was based on Isaiah 63, and yet I pointedly asked him in the rebuttal period uh, if the angel of the Lord in that context is identified as the arm of the Lord, and he conceded that to me. Uh, the verse I'm referring to is Isaiah, in Isaiah 63, uh, verse 9, it says, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. And then in verse uh, 12, it says, Who caused his glorious arm, referring to the angel, to go at the right hand of Moses. Solomon admitted that that's a reference to the, uh, the angel of the Lord. Well, in Isaiah 53, right after God speaks in chapter 52 about laying bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and accomplishing salvation, listen to what Isaiah the prophet says, and count with me as well, because Solomon's going to want to know if I gave him two or three witnesses. So this is at least number one. Isaiah 53, verse one, the prophet says, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. Everybody should recognize this is a messianic prophecy. Isaiah is saying that the Messiah is the arm of the Lord, growing up like a root out of parched ground. So Solomon admitted from Isaiah 63 that the angel of the Lord is the arm of the Lord, Isaiah 53, 1. The same prophet, the same book, even in the same major section or division of Isaiah, refers to Jesus, the coming Messiah, as the arm of the Lord. No, what's even worse is Solomon admitted to you that Jesus is the one, the breaker of Basra, right? He's the one that's going to come back and destroy Basra. Guess where that comes from? Isaiah 63. Listen to what it says about that person. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? Uh, and then he goes on and he talks about how nobody was able to accomplish redemption. So he says, uh, uh, my year of redemption has come. I looked and there was no one to help. I was astonished and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me. This is the breaker of Basra, the arm of the Lord. But remember, Solomon said that Jesus is the breaker of Basra. I quite agree with him. Jesus is the breaker of Basra, but Isaiah says he's the arm of the Lord. And he says it not only in one place, he says it in two places, the very context that we were talking about. It also follows that, that the angel of the Lord is not the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 63. I mean, the idea that just because the two are mentioned in close proximity, that that means there's an identification, that's just uh, wildly fallacious. Uh, but the text explicitly tells us that God caused the Holy Spirit, to, or excuse me, the angel of the Lord to go at Moses' right hand, but he put his Holy Spirit within Moses. The, the, ver, or the, the word is singular there, in him. It's, it's his inward parts. So the angel went at his right hand, 
uh, the spirit dwelt within him, clearly distinguishing the angel of the Lord from the Holy Spirit. So I've shown the angel is not the Holy Spirit. The angel is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the arm of the Lord. And I've shown that from two passages in Isaiah. Uh, he also um, uh, admitted to me that the word wonderful is, uh, he knows of no counterexample for the word ever being used for anyone other than a divine person. I pointed out that it's used for the angel of the Lord and the coming Messiah. Uh, and that was recognized by pre-Christian Jews. One of the things that many people don't know about when they read the Bible, and it's a serious deficiency, a perennial problem, not only for Unitarians, but others, is the intertextual nature of Scripture, where Scripture doesn't, you know, the prophets don't refer back to a verse and say, you know, Genesis 1-5. The way they refer back to things is by picking up words, especially distinctive terms not used very often, uh, sometimes whole clusters of words found in another context, in order to alert the reader that this is referring back to that. This is why the Jews recognized, they picked up on this word wonderful used for the coming Messiah in Isaiah 9, 6, and understood it to be a reference to the angel, though they said it's the angel of great counsel. The same thing that's explicitly stated actually in Malachi 3, 1, when it says that the one who's coming is the messenger of the covenant, the angel of the covenant. Now, uh, Solomon says that I'm just, uh, you know, uh, mixing context here, or I forget exactly how he put it. He said, um, uh, I forget the exact terminology that he used, that, that it's just sort of being arbitrary or something like that. But notice that Malachi 3.1 is echoing the language of the Exodus. I send my messenger ahead of you. That would have alerted anyone to the, uh, the fact of the Exodus. So when he then talks about the angel of the covenant going before them, there would have been no question in the mind for anybody whose ear was attuned to the Old Testament who he's talking about, especially when he's called there the angel of the covenant, when it's the angel of the Lord himself who explicitly says that he's the one who established the covenant with Israel. In Judges 2.1, it says, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and led you into the land which I swore to your forefathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. So no Jew would have wondered what he meant by the angel of the covenant. These passages are explicitly applied to Jesus by Mark in Mark chapter 1. It's also applied to Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus is explicitly identified as the fulfillment of that new Exodus prophecy. So over and over again, Jesus is identified as the divine angel. Now, Solomon's response to John 8, where Jesus claims to have seen Abraham and to have interacted with him is, 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 is quite interesting. Solomon thought that it might be the case that the angel of the Lord is the one who appeared in Sodom and rained down the fire from Jehovah. Now, I would agree with that. You know, he said he's not certain, but I, I think, you know, you could be more than certain. But but in any case, the, the reason this is relevant is because the angel of the Lord, the, the, the Lord who rained fire on, and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, is the very one who was just previously talking to Abraham in Genesis 18. He went down into Sodom. The text even says it in Genesis 18. He was going down into Sodom. So the same one who spoke to Abraham in the form of a man then goes down into Sodom and rains fire from Jehovah out of heaven. The same one the Jews called the Word, the Memra, the Logos. Um, uh, he said, uh, you know, but in John 8, you know, he mentioned, I, I really don't get his response here. Uh, it seems like he, he was just struggling at the bit here and didn't know what to say. In John 8, very clearly, Jesus said Abraham did not try to kill him. And then later in the context, the Jews understood what he was saying, which is why they say, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. This very clearly ties Jesus in with the angel of the Lord. That's why it was relevant for me to point out that the angel is identified as God, that Jesus is identified as God, that the angel's preexistent, Jesus is preexistent, the angel appeared to people. By the way, Solomon said the angel of the Lord did appear to people after the resurrection. That's not true. In Acts chapter 8, it does not mention the angel of the Lord. The only occurrence of the, anaf of the articular use of, of angel uh, with, with angel in the New Testament is always anaphoric, which means it has nothing to do with the kind of construction found in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord never appears in the New Testament. It's always, the, the angel completely disappears from the incarnation onward, and it's Jesus who appears after the resurrection, never the angel. Where did the angel of the Lord go? I'll tell you where he went. Mark 1 tells us, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He is that messenger who is predicted by the prophets, the angel of the covenant. All right, thank All you. All right, thank you. Well, I hear an echo oh, now. I hear an echo now. Oh, I better. Yeah, might want to mute your audio there. It uh, looks like you have. 
<clears throat> All right. Thank you, Anthony, for your rebuttal. And let me get let me get Solomon back up with us. Solomon. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so we got your mic on. And uh, one second, yeah. I'm going to get you on the screen by yourself. Anthony rudely went five seconds over, so uh, <laughs> you've got an extra five seconds added to your time, sir. Uh, let me get you up by yourself here. All right, and you can start whenever you're ready. Eight minutes. Well, the use of similar titles does not prove a one-to-one -one equivocation of person-to-person. -person. We know that David's called king of Israel. Jehovah God is called the king of Israel. We know we have many kings uh, throughout uh, the throughout Israel's history. Doesn't mean they're Jehovah. It doesn't mean just because there will there's similar titles. There's a title used for the future Davidic king in Isaiah nine six and seven, and the angel that appears to Samson's parents and they're both the phrase "wonderful" is used. Um, I would not let that similar titles being used or similar uh, things being used of two different people to mean they're the same people. Um, their saviors brought on, uh, raised up unto Israel, Jehovah would say, that would judge Israel. The judges were called saviors. We know in Psalm 82, the judges are called uh, mighty ones. They're called gods. Does this mean they're Jehovah? No. So um, just because there's similar uh, names or titles used of two different people doesn't make them equated. And so that's what I would submit to you about uh, the angel of the Lord and Jesus in terms of Isaiah 63. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 63, uh, Jesus, who is described in the first few verses, that's about the future when he comes back. When we go to Isaiah 63, 7, and it talks about the angel of the Lord and his activity uh, uh, leading Israel out of Egypt, leading them through the wilderness, that's past tense. So that's not, that's not the same person because they're not the same situation. Once future, Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, and once past, Isaiah 63, 7 through 14. So again, my uh, the, the debate here isn't whether the angel of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. I think, again, uh, that's my view, but the, but the fact is, Anthony has to prove that Jesus is that angel of the Lord. Now, he says the angel of the Lord doesn't appear after the resurrection. We'll grant him that, okay? And he asked the question, where is the angel of the Lord? Well, um, the question is, when we go to the book of Hebrews, the author goes out of his way to make the point that the angel, if anything, wherever the angel of the Lord is, it isn't on the throne of David. He goes out of his way uh, throughout that chapter to prove that Jesus is not an angel. And of course, we know that a Trinitarian will say, well, yeah, that's because the angel of the Lord just isn't any angel. But again, if we take uh, what the scripture says for what it says— then there's no angel that has been granted authority to sit on the throne of David. That is strictly reserved for David's offspring. In fact, there's no allusion, even Psalm 89, which is a commentary on the Davidic covenant, there's no allusion at all to this future seed of David having anything to do with being a pre-existent angel. And uh, as, as far as Sodom and Gomorrah goes, whether that's Jehovah God himself or whether that's the angel Jehovah, the one thing we have missing there is the identification of Jesus being that angel that rained fire and brimstone from Jehovah God out of heaven. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 18, when Jehovah appears to Genesis with the, with the two others, the two other angels, um, again, uh, Jesus is not identified as being in that situation. And that's what we have to prove. Is Jesus, or that's what Anthony has to prove, is Jesus the angel of the Lord? Again, you can get texts that show indicate pre-existence, and that's not the argument here, whether Jesus was pre-existent or not. And you can get texts of the angel of the Lord's activity, but there's never made a direct connection with Jesus and the angel of the Lord. And again, uh, like David's called king of Israel and Jehovah is, we know David is not Jehovah. Okay, there, there are times where, you know, the blind man said I am uh, in, in the book of, in the New Testament. So does that mean that the blind man is claiming the title of Jehovah? We actually see a title used for Jehovah in Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4. Um, the one who, who was, is, and is to come. So, again, even if uh, this is not an argument about Jesus' deity, this is not an argument about his preexistence, the argument sp is specific to Jesus being the angel of the Lord. And, again, whether or not the angel of the Lord appeared after Jesus' resurrection, again, is not proof that Jesus is that angel. That is guessing. That is saying, because you don't see that angel, 
and, and that's debatable itself because I do believe the angel of the Lord is in Acts chapter 8. The fact of the matter is, even if he doesn't appear after the resurrection, the one thing we know, according to the author of Hebrews, that there is no angel that is allowed to sit on the throne of David, and there is no angel that's been told, Thou art my son, this day have it begotten thee, because that is specific, again, uh, to the royal offspring of David, and not one mention in the book of Acts. See, our, our preaching should model what the book, how they preach in the book of Acts. That is our template in how we preach the gospel, and zero mention of Jesus being the angel of the Lord in the book of Acts. And again, uh, whether Paul believes himself in preexistence or not, and whatever Galatians 4 means, I still believe, I still hold to that, is referring to the time fulfilled, the fulfillment of the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, the anointing of the Most Holy Jesus at his baptism. But even if what Paul says is true about that verse, it's still not identifying Jesus as the angel of the Lord. Again, we don't have a clear statement from Scripture that Jesus is the angel of the Lord from Jesus himself, from the prophets, from the apostles, from God himself, from God the Father. And that's what we would need in order to firmly say Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Because if we just go by commonalities that we see uh, described about Jesus and commonalities about other people, then why isn't he Melchizedek? You know, um, but we don't do that. That's not how we should understand scripture in terms of the identity of Jesus. We should understand it, as I mentioned at the beginning of this. What do the prophets say about him? What do his apostles say? What do the apostles that came after say, like Paul, Barnabas, uh, who I believe wrote Hebrews? Uh, what does Jesus say about himself? But zero, a, zero as far as a clear statement that Jesus is that angel. And that's, that's the heart of the matter is when we're preaching the gospel, as Paul said, if we have another Jesus, we bring another spirit and another gospel. Again, I make no aspersions on anybody because, again, we're all learning, but it's still important. And if if that's what Paul is saying, we better have the right Jesus. And so we should stick with what's revealed to us in Scripture clearly, the simplicity of Christ, and not fall for the evil, for the subtlety like Eve was deceived. And because, again, you know, we see the angel of the Lord. He, he's a big part of God's salvation program from uh, the burning bush in Egypt, or the burning bush through Egypt, into the through the Red Sea, into the wilderness, into the land of Canaan. I grant that. Jesus, obviously, is the Savior. Jesus, the story of the New Testament, is the birth of Jesus all the way through him bringing in New Jerusalem, and he is that Savior. But again, God rose up judges to Israel to be saviors unto them. It doesn't mean they're uh, equated one for one, is what I'm saying. And, um, you know... And, and, and that's it. All right. Uh, Solomon finished up a few seconds early there. Anthony, do you have your mic back on? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Very good. All right. So, Solomon, could you mute your microphone? Yes. And all we're going to have now, we're going to have five-minute conclusions for each side so anthony let you me get you up on the screen and you have five minutes sir okay this is my closing statement so i don't have uh, really any time for rebuttal i just want to summarize what we've seen in this debate in order to help you analyze it uh, if you want to go back and listen to it uh, what have we seen in this debate? Well, I think in the first place from Solomon, we've seen a number of devastating problems that riddled his attempt to refute the notion that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. In the first place, we saw the long-running false antithesis that uh, plagued his opening presentation, where he said Jesus is the seed of David, therefore he can't be all those other things that the prophets say. Now, of course, that's not how he put it. Uh, he, but he, he certainly swept those things under the carpet. The prophets very clearly say more about the Messiah than simply that he is uh, a descendant of David. In fact, we even saw him uh, engaging in misquotation of the New Testament to bolster his case, such as his quotation of Revelation 22, when Jesus said not only is he the offspring of David, which Solomon said, but he's also the root of David. So we've seen false antithesis and misquotation. We also saw Solomon, in order to get out of a bind, swapping the syntax of the Greek sentences, or the sentences, you know, the English text at least, because I don't think he knows Hebrew or Greek, but uh, in, in Galatians 4, to get out of a, a tight spot, 
he said that he was made of a woman and then God sent, uh, sent him forth, meaning at his baptism. But Paul has it in exactly the opposite order. He sent out his son, uses a very strong term in Greek, the same term used for the spirit, clearly indicating his existence before Mary. Uh, we also see him ignoring quite a bit of what I had to say. Uh, he, he didn't have anything to say ab about the vast majority of my opening presentation. Now, uh, I don't want to be overly critical here. I think I said a lot. You know, somebody might say I even shotgunned him, but uh, not to be, uh, you know, mean or anything like that. But, uh, you know, if somebody intrudes in your house, then nobody has the, the intruder doesn't have a right to complain that you pulled out a shotgun. Uh, I consider Solomon a fellow human being, uh, but at the same time, he does not hold to the Christ of the Bible, and so he's a theological intruder into the house of God, and so, uh, you know, I, uh, I think that he should have dealt with what came from both barrels. Um, we saw a number of mere assertions, especially in his last rebuttal, uh, where he kept, kept saying, Jesus is never identified as the angel of the Lord. My goodness, what have I been doing this whole debate? My opening presentation, passage after passage, uh, my rebuttals, passage after passage. I showed very clearly that Jesus is identified as the angel of the Lord. Everything that's said about the angel of the Lord is said about Jesus. Now, he kept saying it's irrelevant that Jesus is, it, whether the angel or Jesus is God. Well, no, it's not irrelevant, because if Jesus is the angel, then he has to be God. And if there are only three persons in the Old Testament identified as God, and Jesus is identified as one of three persons who are God in the New Testament, then he has to be one of those three persons. Clearly, he's not the Father or the Holy Spirit. Both of us would agree. Well, I already proved also that the angel of the Lord is not the Father or the Holy Spirit. It follows logically that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. It also follows from those new Exodus passages that I talked about. Isaiah 40, verse 3, Malachi 3, 1, where he's explicitly called the angel. Now, he says that I'm just, uh, you know, making this about the angel of the Lord. But again, remember, this is talking about, this is Exodus language. The author is a Jew. He's talking to people that are supposed to know their scriptures. When he talks about a new Exodus, and he speaks of that angel coming, they're not thinking along Solomonic lines. I mean, this Solomon, not the true Solomon from the days of uh, uh, da David, but uh, that's the lines they're thinking on. They're not, you know, post-Christian uh, Unitarians. They're not Socinians or Anabaptists or any of those things. They're Jews. They're steeped in the Old Testament. They would have thought the very thing that I've been arguing in this debate. We saw that that is applied to Jesus explicitly in the New Testament, in Mark 1, in Matthew 11. Malachi 3, 1 is applied to Jesus. Uh, I've shown numerous ways by which we can identify Jesus as the angel of the Lord. He's identified as the one who Moses identified with and suffered the reproach of Christ, which is the very thing the angel of the Lord told him to do in, Malachi, or in, in Exodus 3. Hebrews 11.25 says that was Jesus. When it says that the angel of the Lord went before and behind them, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 says that was Jesus. When it tells us the angel of the Lord destroyed some of those who didn't believe, Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 10.9 says that was Jesus. When we ask who led the people out of Egypt, the book of Exodus says it was the angel of the Lord. When we ask the apostle Jude, he says it was Jesus in Jude 1.5. Now, even if you go with Solomon's uh, variant here, where it says the Lord led them out of Egypt, contextually, the Lord is Jesus because, and I disagree with his translation there, the King James uh, is not accurate. It literally says that Jesus is our only sovereign and Lord, our only sovereign and Lord. So when it, if it says in verse five that the Lord led them out of Egypt, contextually, it's talking about Jesus. So I gave a very clear case for the angel of the Lord being God, whereas on the other hand, the opposing case was riddled with false antithesis, misquotation, swapping the syntax, ignoring context, asserting things, and so forth. And I'll conclude with that. All right, Solomon. All right, Solomon. Whoops, I'm hearing an echo. Anthony, mute your stuff. Uh, are you unmuted, Solomon? I'm unmuted. Okay, Anthony once again went five or six seconds over, so... You have, you're, you're free to use an extra five or six seconds, but start whenever you're ready, sir. Got it. Um, so this subject is, uh, I have a passion for this subject because I at one time believed Jesus was the angel of Jehovah. Um, and it's something that growing up as a Christian, it's automatically assumed. But if we have a passion for truth, and I went on a search for truth of who Jesus is, who is the Jesus of the Bible? And when we... Uh, go to prove Jesus is the Messiah, whether it's to a, a Jew or, or, or someone who's, you know, maybe a Muslim. Uh, we want to come with the Jesus of the Bible. We want to be able to go to those Bereans and say, here, this is where Jesus is found in the Bible. Um, 
we again we have a theme all the way from Genesis three fifteen to Revelation twenty two sixteen a consistent theme one uh, Jesus we know is going to be a human being uh, that's without controversy again I know Anthony mentions the antith antithesis that they don't deny that but the fact is just because you acknowledge the truth that Jesus is the seed of David doesn't give you without scriptural evidence hard evidence to pack on. Uh, several other things about Jesus. That one, he's the angel of the Lord, or uh, the hypostatic union, he's God and man, or he's God himself. We have to just go with what's clearly written in the scriptures. And again, I believe the Bible paints a beautiful portrait of who the coming Messiah would be. This story is all about Jesus. It, it starts in Genesis. Uh, we know it's even before that because of First Peter 1, 18 through 21, the lamb slain before the foundation. As I said before, it goes to Abraham, it goes to Israel, Judah, goes to David, and then it's realized finally at the birth of Jesus, the beautiful birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he sent forth, the time is fulfilled, Daniel 9, 27, the anointing of the Most Holy, the beginning of the 70th week, he's baptized. And then he sent forth, as he's identified in, in the book of Acts, as being sent to Israel from the time of the Jordan River. And then he goes on to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He dies, he's resurrected, and as I said, the, the book of Acts goes out of their way to show you that Jesus fulfilled the Davidic covenant at his resurrection and ascension, sitting on the throne of David, verified in Hebrews 1. And then in the book of Revelation, the book to all end books literally, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and the offspring of David. Now, that word root is just, it's shoot. It's a, it's a shoot. It doesn't mean he's he existed before David, okay? And why does uh, David call Jesus Lord? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise. David's going to answer to Jesus at the resurrection. He's going to be under Jesus Christ. He's going to call him Lord because Jesus is that eternal Davidic king. I love Jesus. I, I honor him and I worship him. And I don't deny the scriptures that ascribe to him. Uh, uh, you know, someone mentioned uh, John 20, 28. I, I can fully say my Lord and my God, but I understand it within the context of G by whom the word of God came they were called gods, referring to the judges of Israel, Psalm 82. And I apply it to Jesus as a Davidic king, divine, because he's been resurrected and glorified as the first begotten son of many brethren. Can we really claim that? See, this is the gospels at stake here. Uh, because Trinitarians, because they have been the ones, uh, you know, basically spreading the gospel. And I, and I don't fault them. I love them. Uh, I believe, you know, they're brethren. And they may not believe I am. That's okay. But the fact is, Jesus said it, until the gospel of the kingdom is preached unto all the world, then the end will come. I believe the reason why the end hasn't come yet, because a false version of Jesus has been promoted, and this angel of the Lord doctrine is, a, is basically a, a big ingredient to that. I think once we show you that Jesus isn't the angel of the Lord, which I believe I have just by going to what the scriptures clearly say, then we can get back to who Jesus is. And this is why a lot of the Jewish people reject the Jesus that, that Christianity brings because it's not in line with who they all expect, a Davidic king, the, the seed of David. And so, as Paul says, uh, his warning is, is true. You know, we have to bring the right Jesus. John says, you know, if someone doesn't bring the doctrine of Christ, we are to reject them. Obviously, we got to have grace with each other because, you know, we're all learning here. We don't have the apostles before us. But it's still the importance of this issue is nonetheless, uh, it should be paramount. And again, I have tons of evidence for Jesus being the seed of David. It's not an antithesis. I know the Trinitarians acknowledge that, but we just can't. That doesn't give us the freedom to pack on a bunch of other stuff about who Jesus is. Let's stick with what's clearly written and not just add a bunch of things because, you know, you can get a word here and a word in the Old Testament and put them together. And, uh, you know, uh, this gospel of the kingdom, we, and what is it centered on in the book of Acts? Jesus being the fruit of David's loins, fulfilling the Davidic covenant, the Davidic kingdom being rebuilt and restored, as James said, was being fulfilled with us, the Gentiles, coming in to the commonwealth of Israel. And Paul said it. He's of the seed of David and glorified the Son of God with power. Why is he called the Son of God with power? Because he was ascended to the right hand of God on the throne of David. All right. Thank you, too. Anthony and Solomon for that exchange. Good, everyone uh, kept things friendly. Uh, guys, did, did you want to wrap things up here, or did you want to take a couple of questions? Uh, it's up to you. I'm open, whatever Anthony wants. What do you think, Anthony? Uh, yeah, I'm fine either way. All right. 
I do have my inclination was to rush off because I have another video to make, but I've been outvoted. So we'll take a uh, we'll take a couple of questions here. Uh, so now, guys, the now now's an opportunity to uh, post any questions you have. Please identify. Some of you have already been doing it, but please identify who the question is directed towards because I'll try to go back and forth. So if you have a question for Solomon, point out that this is for Solomon. If you have a question for Anthony, point out that it's for Anthony, and we'll try to get a couple a uh, couple questions in. All right. Question for Solomon. In light of the angel of the Lord saving from Egypt, early and majority manuscript evidence of Jude 5 says Jesus saved them out of Egypt. On what basis do you reject this manuscript evidence? Well, because Jesus wasn't there, I go by, I know I have the King James, and a lot of people don't like the King James translation. But I believe the, the, the word Lord there is valid, that the Lord saved them out of Egypt. And we know that God uses his angels to, de to deliver. He used King David to deliver. But ultimately, that salvation comes from God. I mean, I, I don't believe that that translation, that Jesus uh, saved them, is accurate. I just don't. I, I go with the, the Lord translation in the King James Bible. All uh, right. Question for. Do I get to. Oh, we don't get to respond. If you want to offer a quick response, then he would get to respond to your response, and I'll allow that, but then he gets to do the same thing, just to be clear. So when you answer a question, he gets to give a response. I'm easy, okay, man. So I'm, I'm easy. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Very, very quickly, then. Uh, in the first place, uh, the critical editions are all uh, in agreement here, uh, at least uh, all the ones I'm familiar with or have in my hand at the moment, uh, whether you're talking about UBS 4 whether you're talking about the Tyndale House Greek New Testament, whether you're talking about the Hebrew and Greek uh, Reader's Bible, uh, all of them have textual apparatus that shows that the best, most widely attested reading is Jesus there in Jude 1.5. But more than that, uh, contextually, even if it read Lord, the Lord in the context is identified as Jesus. Jude 1.4, the Greek says uh, that he is our only master and Lord. So when uh, our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So when verse 5 says that the Lord led us out of Egypt, or led the people out of Egypt, contextually it's talking about uh, Jesus. Now, Solomon's answer, I just want people to note, was begging the question. He says, I don't believe it's uh, Jesus there uh, because Jesus wasn't there in the Old Testament. Well, we don't determine in advance what the Bible can tell us. We have to listen to what the text says and follow the text, not make the text follow our theology. All right, uh, Solomon, you can, re you can respond to that since it was your question. Like I said, verse Jude 1-4, the verse, you know, it, it mentions the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, two beings, and then in verse 5, it was the Lord that saved them out of the land of Egypt, and the Lord being the Father. I have Lord there. Uh, I like, I'm not a King James onlyist, but I, I, that's one of my preferred versions, King James and American Standard, so um, that's just what I believe. All right, question for Anthony here from RF. Anthony Rogers, what do you say to the fact that the Septuagint invariably follows the New Testament Greek in translating uh, Malak Yahweh with the indefinite article, i.e. an angel of the Lord? Well, first of all, there's no indefinite article in the Greek. I think what he was trying to say while pretending to know Greek, and by the way, that's Carlos Xavier, the son-in-law of Anthony Buzzard. Uh, so Buzzard was not a very good Greek teacher. There's no article in the Greek text. But if you want to say then that when the New Testament uses the uh, an Arthurist construction, Angelou Theu, well then you shoot yourself in the foot here because Jesus is explicitly called Angelou Theu by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 4.14. Paul says that they received him uh, as if he were uh, the angel of God, Christ Jesus himself. I didn't bring that passage up on the debate uh, in the debate because I didn't want to get into uh, technicalities of Greek. Uh, but uh, since uh, Carlos offered me that gun, I decided to shoot him with it. So you're welcome, Carlos. All right. Um, and since Anthony did respond to your question, you can, you don't have to, but if you wanted to offer any response, you can. Yeah, the Galatians 4.14 about, you know, as an angel of God. I don't think Paul's saying there that Jesus is an angel. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that's, again, a good, a good you know, verse to use to prove that he's the angel of the Lord. They received Paul as, you know, as an angel of God, as Christ. 
a messenger of God. It could be, but I don't think he's he's saying that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. I just don't see that there. Again, I would need more. And listen, okay. I I I would love to believe it. I, I was once a Trinitarian, but I have to see a clear statement, and I don't see that. And that was my whole reason for just going to specific texts, like to prove that he's of the seed of David, because it then right. exposes it that. But anyways, go ahead, Anthony. Uh, um, that's good. I just don't believe well, it. Galatians this 4, is partially 14. why I didn't. Yeah, this is partially why I didn't bring it up because I I knew you didn't know Greek, and your answer uh, affirms that for me. Uh, the construction is appositional. He's calling Jesus Angelutheu, Angel of God. So uh, just uh, you know, grammatically, that's what it means. Now you didn't really refute that. You just said I don't see that there. Well, uh, a person's ability to see isn't determinative about what's there. Somebody's blind. That doesn't mean the sun isn't there. If somebody can't, is deaf, that doesn't mean the music isn't playing. The fact is the text calls him the angel of God. It's appositional in the Greek, which means the, the one is definitional of the other. Angel of God defines Jesus. Even as Christ Jesus. So he re he's received uh, as an angel God even as Christ Jesus, but I don't think that's— No, it, it says, it says he's, uh, you received me as angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Appositional meaning— that the the subsequent uh, phrase defines the earlier. Yeah, phrase. I know it's that word specific. even supplied, but I'm just you know. Yeah. All right, this is not a right. crossfire, guys. So let's go. Uh, let's go on here. Um, Zach says, uh, question to Solomon: You have not shed light on what Jesus said to the Jews that Abraham did not try to kill him. How can that be possible if he never existed? Well. Whether or not, and again, the argument's not pre-existence. The argument is Jesus, the angel of the Lord, and that verse doesn't show that he's the angel of the Lord. Even if he did pre-exist, uh, that's not the argument. The argument is, is he the angel of the Lord? All right. And... You know, the angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham when Abraham was going to uh, offer up Isaac, but it doesn't say that that was Jesus. All right, Anthony. Um, question for Anthony. Um, I haven't scrolled down on this computer, but I see it down here uh, on my other monitor. Question for Anthony. If Christ is not the angel of the Lord or not one with God, how does that affect salvation? Well, in the first place, it falsifies the scriptures because the scriptures repeatedly identify him as God. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.18, 1, John 20.28. 20, and they're not merely calling him uh, a Davidic king. That's not how the language works in the scriptures. Jesus is pointedly called God. He's even given the covenant name of God, Jehovah. Like I said, the vast majority of New Testament quotations about Jehovah are said to be about Jesus in the New Testament. So Jesus is identified as God in that sense, in the sense that he is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Uh, so they would falsify the scriptures, first of all. Secondly, I think it would completely gut the the emphasis and the the uh the passion uh, the the you know the glory of something as simple as john three sixteen. god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son if all you're saying is that god created a man and he could do that pretty easy i think everybody would agree uh, that's not really a uh, uh, you know be, that doesn't really bespeak the love of god what does bespeak the love of god is that the one that he gave on behalf of sinners is his very own son the one who has eternally been in fellowship with him, face to face with him, that one is the one that God gave. But I also think that it uh, uh, it destroys salvation. It destroys it in a number of ways because I do believe that no sinner can redeem other sinners, and no finite creature uh, could uh, pay an infinite debt. And so the, the the person had to be divine and human. He had to be divine so that his death would be of infinite value. He had to be human so that he could die. And so, uh, and then also remember that when man fell into sin, we lost, uh, or the image of God in us became corrupted. That image needed to be restored. And so, as uh, uh, Athanasius rightly pointed out, in order for that divine image to be restored, it had to be nothing less than that one in whose image we were made, who came and united us to himself, and then uh, raised us, us up in him so that we could be conformed to his image, and so on and so forth. He said that he had to be divine uh, for the salvation to have infinite value? Yes. Where is that in the scriptures? Uh, it's in the Psalms when it says that no man can redeem the life of another, Psalm 49. Uh, it's very explicit. Uh, no man can redeem the life of another. And moreover, I mean, Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane reveals this to us. Jesus said, Father, if there be any other way, 
let this cup pass from me. Well, there was another way, according to the Unitarian position, because God could have created sons by the ton, to quote uh, uh, Ahmed Didat, because the son is just a creature, according to Unitarians. But in the, in the Christian position, the Orthodox position, the son is not a created being. He's the eternal son, the eternal image and glory of the Father. So it, uh, a man can't redeem the life of another. Uh, only a divine person whose blood is of infinite value can do that. Yeah, the, you made a good point there. The blood is of infinite value. So it's because his, his blood, blood cleanses us from all his sin. Blood. But it, it doesn't his say blood. it's the blood. And blood comes from a human being. Yeah, it's yes, it's it not it divine says, blood. No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever. So no son of man could pay the penalty for sin. All uh, right. Well, okay, go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, question for Solomon. Joe Sharp says, uh, Matthew states in 420, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But also said in 2817, And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Does this conflict? No, because we know that honor is given to kings. Uh, David was worshipped by Israel, uh, along with Jehovah God, when David was uh, about to, was anointing his son to sit on the throne. We know that's not idolatry, because they're worshiping, worshiping David in respect to his kingship, and Jehovah, of course, as the Almighty God. So there's no controversy to... I mean, we're going to be worshipped, right, uh, by the synagogue of Satan. They're going to worship us at our feet to know that Jesus has loved us. So it doesn't mean we're God but we're being worshipped within respect to put the position we have as God's kings and priests made so because of the blood of Christ. So they, when they worship Christ, they're worshipping him as God's son. And by the way, son of God does not mean uh, a pre-existent being. Son of God means it's applied to the Davidic covenant. I will be his, him to, to him a father, he shall be my son. So the phrase son of God and Messiah are connected to the line of David, Psalm chapter 2. Uh, Psalm, uh, second Samuel seven fourteen. So this whole, what I would tell people, and I know a lot of people, they're Trinitarian, look, find out biblically what son of God means and what Messiah means. That will tell you there then clearly the nature of Jesus. Um, so to worship the son of God and King of Israel is okay because you're worshiping Jehovah God's vice regent that he's put in charge of his people, Israel. All right. Hey, no, notice that Solomon, oh. I thought I got to respond. <laughs> well, you did, because he did, so... What's okay. That? I mean, I'm fine either way. Uh, just, keep, that just keep it short, just keep it short, please. Yeah. Notice that Solomon made a distinction between the worship rendered to God and the worship given to the king. Each were given the worship appropriate to them. Uh, but Jesus, by contrast, as not merely just a descendant of David, but as the uh, the one who is greater than David, one who is greater than Solomon, one greater than Solomon is here, that Jesus demanded the same worship and reverence and honor that belongs to God alone. In John chapter 5, Jesus said in verse 23, so that all will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. There's no distinction that Jesus makes here, the worship appropriate to a king, the worship appropriate to God. He says, I am to be honored just as the Father is honored. Uh, and he said the word son just uh, means a, uh, you know, somebody in the Davidic uh, covenant. Uh, that's not at all true for any number of reasons. Scripture tells us that Jesus was not only the son of David, he was also the son of God, and that sonship clearly antedates his accession to the throne, to the royal throne. Uh, in Acts 13, we're told that he was, uh, his resurrection declared him his son, but he doesn't become son at that point because he's called son before that. He's called son even at the point uh, of his birth in Luke chapter 1. He's called son prior to that by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 4 when he says God sent forth his son. Or in Romans chapter 1 verse 3 where Paul says he was uh, a descendant of David according to the flesh, but declared, openly, publicly acknowledged to be the son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. So the resurrection openly showed him to be more than just a descendant of David according well, to the we, flesh. We be who he said he was, the divine son of God. Well, no, I agree. I just want to clarify that I agree with you and, and, and with, that he's the son of God at his birth because, but remember, notice that he's called the son of God, the son of the most high God in connection with being given the throne of his father, David. Now you go back to first Chronicles, I believe it's 28. Solomon is also called the son of God in connection with being given the throne of David. Jehovah chose Solomon 
to be his son and also to sit on the throne of his father David. So there's a connection between the throne of David and the sonship. That's like 2 Samuel 7, 14. I'll beat him a father, he shall be to me a son. Solomon is chosen to be the son of God by Jehovah and to sit on the throne of David. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 36, he is going to be called the son of the most high God, called future tense, and he's going to be given the throne of his father, David. So again, we know he's acknowledging himself as the son of God all throughout his ministry. So when he's declared to be the son of God with power, that's because he now has the power of the king on the throne of David, not just because he became the son of God, but again, Solomon's the son of God, was the son of God, right? Jehovah chose him to be son in connection with the Davidic throne. There's an intricate connection between the throne of David and the sonship of being the son of God. In uh, John chapter 1, two days after Jesus' baptism, Nathaniel confesses, you are the son of God and king of Israel, because those are equated titles. All right. Here's a question for Anthony. Um I'm really curious if Anthony thinks that there is a time when Christ is not the angel of the Lord in Scripture. So I'm not quite sure how to interpret this. Uh, I'm guessing whether there can be a reference to the angel of the Lord that isn't about uh, Christ. Um, Tell me what you think on this one, Anthony. Okay, well, so in the first place, there's a a distinctive construction when it comes to the angel of the Lord. It's always definite in Hebrew, uh, and and this is different from the use of the term angels for others, which the the term angel is used for human beings, uh, celestial spirits, and even uh, for God in various contexts, anybody who serves in a revelatory capacity. Um, Now, in in the vast majority of the Old Testament, you know, there is some changes in Hebrew over the centuries. Scholars recognize this. In later books of the New Testament, that phrase is used once or twice, I would say, to refer to earthly figures. But we know that it's the same angel throughout the vast majority, almost the entirety of the Old Testament until you get to the latter prophets, because uh, repeatedly the angel refers back to prior instances and identifies himself as the one who did that. Right? Remember, I mentioned the angel of the Lord who appeared to Jacob in Genesis 28, the angel who uh, wrestled with him in uh, Genesis 32. In Genesis 48, Jacob prays to him as the one who redeemed him, identifying him as the same one, says he's the one who his fathers Abraham and Isaac walked before, and identifying him as the same person. In Judges 2.1, an especially significant passage, uh, the angel of the Lord at the time of the judges says, I am the one who led uh, 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 led you out of Egypt, even as I swore to your forefathers. So he's claiming that it, at the time of the judges, that he's the one who led them out of Egypt during that period, who is the one who swore it even earlier to the patriarch. So at least just this much is established. I could establish more, but I'll be brief. At least from Genesis through Judges, you're talking about the same angel of the Lord. And I would argue even further than that. All right. And we'll conclude here with a question for both of you here. Um Question for Anthony and Solomon. Revelation 3.21, Jesus said he sat down with the Father on the Father's throne. According to this verse, who is Jesus? And either, well, one, either one of you can answer first. There's no problem with identifying the when Jesus sits on the throne of the Father, because when Solomon sat on the throne of David, it was also called the throne of Jehovah God. So when you sat on the throne of David in the Old Testament, you were sitting on the throne of God, Jehovah God because it carried Jehovah's authority uh, with it. And so when Jesus sits on the throne of his father, um, there's no problem with that being equated to the throne of David, because as Solomon did, he sat on the throne of David, and it was called the throne of Jehovah God. So it, it, Jesus is still Jesus. Jehovah is the Almighty God. Jesus is his son, his servant. Jesus worships Jehovah, um, and Jesus began to exist at his birth. And uh, that's, you know— how I would say answer that question. All right, Anthony, agree or disagree? Yeah, one of my serious disagreements with the methodology of Unitarians, and it's been true in all of the debates that I've done, is this attempt to reduce Jesus, the reality, to the types of the Old Testament, rather than seeing Jesus as uh, superior to all of that. The very thing Jesus said repeatedly, he's greater than the temple, he's greater than Solomon, he's, you know, one greater than Solomon has come. So when you see that Solomon, for example, said, it says he's seated on the throne of God, that's the earthly throne, which was a type of the true throne in heaven. 
Okay, so just because Solomon is said to have sit, sat on the throne of God, meaning the earthly throne in Jerusalem, uh, doesn't mean that Jesus is seated on the throne, and it means nothing more than that. Rather, Solomon was a type. Jesus was the reality. As a type, Solomon pales by comparison to Jesus. He's a shadow. Jesus is the reality. That's why Jesus, who sits on the throne, receives the same universal worship that belongs to the, uh, the Father who occupies the throne, Revelation 5.13. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. This is said by all creatures in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. All right. Well, that concludes our, our Q&A. Um, like to give each of our participants uh, one minute for any uh, concluding thoughts, or you can tell people where to where to go to find anything else that you want them to go to. Uh, I'll start with Anthony, so that um, so uh, so that Solomon gets gets the last word here. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, okay. Um, well, I just want to thank Solomon uh, for the debate. I hope he uh, uh, had a good time. You know, I, I ultimately hope that he thinks through the issues we talked about, as I'm sure he hopes it's true in my case. Uh, I was animated. I'm passionate about these things. I earnestly desire his uh, confession of faith in Christ as the true Lord God of the Old Testament, uh, and that accounts for my uh, passionate appeal. And I also hope that everybody else was uh, conscientiously listening. And if anybody does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would turn to him in repentance and faith as their only hope of redemption the redemption that was accomplished by uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, thank you, Anthony. And uh, Solomon, you're you're more of a guest than Anthony is because I know, I've know i known Anthony for years. So uh, final words, sir. All right. Thank you, uh, David, and thank you, Anthony. I know Anthony's a heavy hitter in uh, these debate scenarios. I've done a few. Um, this one I agreed to do because this subject about Jesus being the angel of the Lord is a passion of mine. Um you know, I a lot of Trinitarians, I can understand their viewpoint. I was one. And I could see the viewpoint that you don't want to reduce Jesus to less than God Almighty. I understand the, the concern there. I understand the fear and where that will take you. And it is a it is a rough journey coming out of Trinitarianism. It was I, That's how I deemed someone to be a Christian back in the day. I was a staunch Trinitarian. But let me tell you, when it, acknowledging that Jesus is the seed of David without adding uh, him being an angel or preexistent or being God, although it may seem to you that we are lowering Jesus, my my uh, adoration for Jesus has never been stronger. It To me, it heightens to me who he is. It makes me appreciate what he did for us as, as a man uh, denying himself, picking up his cross like we all have to do, and, and the, the Davidic covenant and the Davidic dynasty, and seeing that come to uh, being prophesied about, being anticipated. Just think of Mary getting this message from the angel Gabriel. 600 years they had not had a Davidic king, much less too many righteous ones. And here she's getting this announcement that that her son is going to be that prophesied Davidic king. And so uh, my appreciation for Jesus has skyrocketed. And I know that's the fear of Trinitarians, is that by le lessening him in their eyes, they'll, they'll lose that appreciation. But I, I, let me tell you, on the other side, I appreciate him so much more. He's more real to me than he ever has been before. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, everyone, for watching. i um, not sure what we have scheduled for tomorrow, but we'll see what happens. Oh, yeah. I think I'll be on with the Apostate Prophet tomorrow. So catch you all later. That's not what he jab calls him. <laughs> we'll see what the... We'll lamest, see what, lamest nickname ever. We'll see what AP calls Hey, Jab. Catch you all later. <laughs> all right.